All right, guys, so welcome to a very, very special video. Now, this is a video that's been in the works for many months now. It's taken a lot of time, effort, and hard work. This is a timeless classic. It's going to be a video that you can enjoy for years to come. This is the Locust Law movie. A full breakdown of the Locust from Emergence Day, the origins, the Locust species, the military, and so much more. The reason why I made this movie is to have a streamlined law movie experience so it would really mean a lot to me if you can drop a like on the video before the movie begins and if you do want to further support the channel you can do so by becoming a member which is just a couple of quid per month and it really helps to support the channel and it helps support me to keep creating amazing law videos like this for many years to come so your support would be much appreciated and do consider subscribing if you are new to the channel, if you do enjoy the lore movie and if you'd like to see more. You know, the Gears of War franchise just means so much to me and I really wanted to make my mark on Gears of War on YouTube and I definitely think I have made my mark and given Gears of War and Xbox fans many amazing Gears of War lore videos to enjoy. From here you can expect quality lore videos on your favourite gaming franchises, so stay tuned for that. But yeah, without further ado, sit back, relax. And I really, really hope you enjoy the video. The most well-known event in the Gears of War universe to the humans of Sierra was a dark day. It was the beginning of humanity's supposed doom, Emergence Day. It was the emergence of a new war-torn world with over a quarter of the total human population dying on the very first day. So Emergence Day was also known as E-Day, so I'll also be referring to it as E-Day throughout the video. E-Day was a swift, full-scale, coordinated and unprecedented planet-wide assault on the surface of Sera initiated by the Locust Horde. The Locust emerged and deployed in nearly every single major human city on the surface of Sera, attacking and killing humans Regardless of race, age or gender, there were massive casualties everywhere the Locust arrived. The Locust Horde were not only a force of nature, they were more stronger and aggressive than humans, and they had an army of war beasts at their disposal. Their attacks and dominance were of textbook military invasion, so they were far from mindless beasts. In fact, many high-ranking leaders of the Locust Horde were considered to be geniuses in terms of military strategy easily disposing of organized cog resistance. In the days before the Locust emergence, an epidemic of earthquakes and tremors were reported across Sera, puzzling scientists and journalists. After the first emergence, initial reports by the press and news media attested that grey monsters were emerging from the underground and slaughtering civilians, as told by surviving witnesses. In the early hours of Emergence Day, many believed that this was an elaborate hoax or promotion for a new sci-fi film. Others, who took the threat more seriously, initially believed that the Pendulum Wars had started again, or that the Grazni were attacking, until Chairman Thomas Daliel made an announcement that a new and foreign enemy was attacking the surface from the Hollow, which was an underground tunnel network beneath the surface of Sera. One of the first cities to have reports of an unknown enemy attacking was Janamont, where the death toll would reach over 100,000. Images of the massacred on the Janamont Highway were shown on news networks across Sera, and Janamont also held a large army base within the city. The battle was personally led by the Locust General Ram and Cantus Scourge of the Locust Horde. After the eradication of the Janamont base, the Locust forces moved into the city and began slaughtering civilians. Among other major cities attacked was the capital city of Afera. However, a natural bedrock of granite, the Jacinto Plateau, spared many cities in Tyrus from the scourge of the Locust Horde, namely Jacinto City. While Afera was attacked due to natural fissures in the bedrock, as well as the subway and sewage tunnels offering access to the city, the COG managed to fill access points with gas and cement and was successful in blocking the Locust out of Afera, as well as other cities on the plateau. Other locations on Sera were spared due to natural defences as well. Islands such as the South Islands, the Lesser Islands chain including Vectus and Azora, were spared due to trenches and difficulty digging under the oceans. As for the mainland, all major cities outside the Jacinto Plateau were attacked and destroyed by the Locust Horde. The Republic of Garaznia, 
which was the only UIR country to not surrender, fell on emergence day to General Khan with the aid of the Shibboleth. Other countries once belonging to the UIR, including Vaskar, had fell to the Locust Horde. But Emergence Day would eventually end and the Locust Horde would continue advancing across Era, destroying everything and killing everyone in their path. Shortly after Emergence Day, a census across Sarah revealed that billions, specifically 25% of the entire human race was killed in the initial onslaught of the Locust Horde. Millions more were declared missing, with people either lost in the chaos, their corpses not found, or many being captured by the Locust Horde. The rumours of the missing since E-Day were ranged from the Locust eating humans to the Locust taking prisoners. But in reality, the Locust did capture millions of humans. Many of the captured were used by the Locust scientist Ukon. Another major use was enslaving humans into labour camps. Humans were also used to feed the Locust creatures such as the blood mounts, and due to the locusts' hatred, the enslaved humans were put through various methods of torture, which was known as processing, which resulted in either lobotomy or death. Because of the horrors experienced in the aftermath of Emergence Day, the survivors believed those who were killed on E-Day were fortunate enough to not witness what Sarah had become. And so the saying among the survivors on Sarah was created, the lucky ones died on E-Day. Emergence Day was such a significant event in the history of mankind that the age-old calendar system was abolished in favour of a year marking system that involved counting the years before and after Emergence Day to mark an event. So it was split into BE meaning before emergence and AE meaning after emergence. The year of emergence was in the year 5992 but this was later designated as the year zero with events before E-Day, 0 BE, and events after E-Day, known as 0 AE. Now let's look at the backstory behind Emergence Day and the events that led up to this horrific event in Sarah's history. Now the Locust lived in the Hollow. Ever since the Mount Kadar laboratory uprising where Queen Mira had led her children, the Locust, into the underground tunnel networks of Sarah, the Hollow. They gained their independence, built their own civilization, repopulated their people, and used the hollow creatures as transportation, equipment, and weapons. They began to thrive as a civilization until they encountered problems of their own, the Lambent. So let's cast our eyes to the year 7 BE, which is seven years before Emergence Day. Members of the Locust Horde began becoming infected with Lambency, which possessed and mutated the infected to kill or infect all living organisms around it. So the Lambent were a race of semi-sentient mutants made up of any living organism infected by emulsion. Lambency is caused by constant exposure to emulsion and has the ability to subvert and mutate its host, robbing them of their free will and transforming them into a mindless, heartless killing machine with no other goal but to spread the infection. But this was all caused by emulsion, a parasitic fungal organism that appeared as a naturally occurring, luminescent, highly volatile liquid. This was found in the hollow on Sarah, where the locust had actually made their own civilization. But the humans commonly refined emulsion into a fuel source, and as we know, humans love to go to war over energy sources, and so it was the most sought after resource on the planet. The countries under the coalition of ordered governments that possessed an abundance of emulsion reserves soon found themselves at war with those nations who were not as fortunate, now under the political regime of the Union of Independent Republics. This was a conflict known as the Pendulum Wars, and the Pendulum Wars became a global conflict that would last for 79 years, with millions dead, and the Pendulum Wars would end six weeks before Emergence Day. But seven years before Emergence Day, underground in the hollow, the locust engaged in the Lambent War due to the epidemic of the Lambent. The war caused considerable casualties in the locust and they were losing territory in the hollow to the Lambent. Meanwhile, on ground level in 7 BE, the humans of Sera were still engaged in the Pendulum Wars, being 72 years into the war, with an end almost nowhere in sight. So, could Emergence Day have been prevented? Did the humans have previous knowledge of the Locust's existence prior to E-Day? Well, 
In 9 BE, so 9 years before Emergence Day, biologist Dr. Elaine Phoenix, who was actually the mother of Marcus Phoenix, was studying the mutations of rock shrews in the inner hollow when she discovered the locust horde. In her journal, she studied them and she planned to make an announcement on their existence. However, Dr. Phoenix was found by the locust horde and executed. However, four years later, in 5 BE, Professor Adam Phoenix, Dr. Phoenix's husband, followed the tracks of his late wife. Professor Phoenix met with Queen Mira, who revealed that her people were being killed or infected by the Lambent. Queen Mira expressed her plans to invade and colonize the surface in order to evade the Lambent. Professor Adam Phoenix promised to help aid in her research to cure Lambency, to keep the locust underground and from committing genocide. However, Adam Phoenix was called on by the Coalition of Ordered Governments to prepare the Hammer of Dawn, which was an orbital laser beam weapon, a weapon of mass destruction, in order to end the Pendulum Wars against the Union of Independent Republics. Adam Phoenix also discovered that nearly all biological cures would fail against the Lambent Mutagen, and other physical measures that would kill the Lambent would also harm the Locust Horde. Professor Phoenix was successful in completing the Hammer of Dawn and was used to end the war against the UIR. So most of Sarah was celebrating the end of the war. But in early 0 BE, underground, the Lambent War had reached a crucial stage in which a promising Locust soldier, Voldram, had the same desires as Queen Mira to invade the surface. Arranging a coup against the High General Uzil Srak at the time, Voldram expressed his belief in the futility of the Lambent War and the future that they could have on the surface. Queen Mira then promoted Voldram to Uzil, so he became her new general and revealed that she as well had been planning the attack on the humans. So then Queen Mira and Uzil Ram then began to strategize their emergence. Queen Mira had ultimately lost faith in Professor Phoenix, more of her people were dying and the Locust grew impatient. They were losing more outposts in the hollow and so she revisited her plans to launch her army onto the surface alongside her new general, General Ram. Their plan involved to strike against all major cities on Sera, especially capital cities and those with substantial military or industrial involvement. In order to secure occupation of the city, cedars were used to ink the skies with nemesis to create krill storms allowing the krill to kill all humans in a city during the daylight. After eradicating all military and civilian presence, the locust would be able to occupy a city and strip it for resources and weapons. Fueling the motives to destroy humanity came from Queen Mira's hatred of humans for imprisoning, experimenting, torturing the locust, forcing them underground and for the supposed murder of her infant daughter. She feared that humans would not accept the locust and attempt to control or kill them if she revealed themselves. Her motives were also caused by humanity's failure to assist the Locust. As Queen Mira employed Professor Adam Phoenix to cure the Lambency, but he was unable to produce one. She saw the Locust as a superior race, that the humans were inferior, and so that Sarah should be claimed by the Locust Horde. The Locust War would begin as the Locust emerged on E-Day with humanity's and Sarah's fate on the line, in a war that would go on to last 17 years. So during the mission to Mount Kadar Laboratory, Kate Diaz, who was the granddaughter to Mira and daughter to Reina Torres, alongside Delmont Walker, entered the laboratory accompanied by an artificial intelligence of Niall Samson, where they found the first created drones who were known as the first successful hybrids. So as with the drone's ancestors, who were of course the sires, some Locust drone hybrids remained in stasis, while others had been frozen to death during Mira's rampage after the supposed death of her daughter, which led to a revolt. After Kate's connection to the swarm was disconnected and the matriarch was awakened, the first successful Locust drone hybrids emerged from their stasis, pledging their allegiance to their new queen. But they were wiped out along with the sires within the laboratory and the matriarch was killed as well by Kate and Del. So that's a brief overview, but let's look into the backstory and more diving into the lore of the Locust drone hybrids themselves. So as Niles stated, the path to every breakthrough is paved with failure. Before the first successful Locust drone hybrids, 
they had created many unstable specimens, but they remained in stasis. But Nile stated that they were able to have a breakthrough as one of the miners' children was resistant to aging and disease and was raised as one of their own. In the previous facility, which was the New Hope Research Facility, they had problems with genetic stability. The sires were distempered and sterile, and this was a problem for obvious reasons, as the sires were very difficult to control, and of course they were unable to reproduce as well. But Locust, they were different. They were highly controllable, and they were the perfect soldiers, and they were able to reproduce well as well. So what made them different? Well, what made them different was their cells. The Emotion Miners children provided a genetic repository, as did the indigenous creatures of the Hollow. But when the extent of one very special child's genetic immunity to emotion became clear, who was of course Mira, Niles and the scientists' work began to soar. Mira was horrifically, monstrously bred with the sires, and her stem cells were complementary to sire DNA, which produced the successful locust-drone hybrids and the locust. So they were Mira's offspring, but young Mira's strong maternal feelings were underestimated as she had a strong attachment to the locust, as of course they were her children ultimately. Whether they were human or not, they were still her offspring. And when Reyna was born, it was discovered that Reyna had inherited many of Mira's abilities, including her connection to the hive mind. However, Dr. Torres feared his own daughter would be experimented on and he fled the facility with her, so they basically escaped. So Niles and the scientists were unable to recapture her, so Niles actually lied to Mira and said that Reyna had died during the escape attempt. So Mira was horrified by this and Mira grew a hatred for the humans and empathy for the locusts, so she began to hate humans and she really started to take the locusts side, who were her children, as the locusts longed for independence and to no longer be tortured by the humans. So as a result this led to Queen Mira's revolt and the scientists including Niles were all slaughtered and the first generation of locusts were led into the hollow and they gained independence. I believe Uzil Srak was one of these locusts as Srak stated to Ukon that he was the true spawn of the sires. And Ukon would have been amongst these locusts as well as Ukon was known as Patient Zero in the New Hope Research Facility and he was the only sire who retained his mental capacity, but he was still ill with Ruslong. Down. So Ukon was actually once a human, believe it or not, and he was born and raised in Tyrus to an emotion miner during the Pendulum Wars. And at a certain point, Ukon developed a condition which was known as Ruslung due to overexposure to emotion fumes. His father, among others in their community, also became infected with the fatal condition. So of course, due to the newfound health effects of emotion exposure discovered by the Coalition of Ordered Governments, the Department of Health established the New Hope Research Facility to house the children of emotion miners infected with Ruslung. So this was set up to study the toxicity of emotion and to create a cure. Among the children taken and imprisoned for experiments was Ukon, and he was also known as Patient Zero. Now the fact that Ukon was called Patient Zero of Ruslung suggests that he was likely the first human infected with the disease, or at least the first known human. But that's just a theory. Now the New Hope Research Facility had a director, and this was Dr. Nile Sampson. 
and he began his experiments by injecting the children with daily doses of concentrated emotion to study its effects. And of course, one of these children was Ukon. So the research showed that while it caused immediate cell stress and degradation, other cells underwent point mutations that could be seen as beneficial in genetic engineering. Later, one of the doctors that was there, who was known as Dr. Torres, discovered that one of the children, who was known as Mira, exhibited complete immunity to emulsion and rustlung. Also, Mira benefited from emulsion exposure as it decelerated her aging by 50% and supercharged her immune system. Due to this discovery, Dr. Sampson hoped to transfer or replicate her immunity in the other children. The Dr. Sampson had a theory that the indigenous creatures of the hollow were also genetically immune to the effects of emulsion due to their proximity as they actually lived nearby to the emulsion itself and began working with transgenics by splicing the children with the DNA of the hollow creatures. So of course this is where it goes downhill, it gets graphic, it goes wrong and of course this was not supposed to happen right because they were supposed to find a cure for Ruslung. So the children were mutated into horrific creatures that became mindless, feral and highly aggressive as well as genetically unstable, distempered and sterile. And he called these mutated children the sires. So they were no longer human children. They were these horrific creatures that were known as the sires. And they began to exhibit some resistance similar to Mira's immunity, but ultimately failed as they each resulted in death. And this declared Mira as a medical anomaly, so she couldn't really be replicated. But when Ukon was transformed into a sire, he retained his mental capacity. So his knowledge from being a human, he retained his language, etc. But he was just as sadistic as the other sires. You could say he was just a sire anomaly really. But despite still being afflicted with Ruslung, Ukon gained similar genetic abilities as Mira. Ukon, when exposed to emotion, gained the ability of accelerated healing when wounded, making Ukon physically immortal. However, the New Hope Research Facility developed a failsafe and developed cytostatic gas to block Ukon's healing abilities if he became out of control. And to be honest, not if, but when, because it was bound to happen. So, with Ukon's retained mental capacity and accelerated healing abilities, Dr. Samson became convinced not to just research a cure for Ruslung, but he became crazy. He wanted to genetically create enhanced soldiers to end the pendulum wars, as well as evolving the human race in general to become stronger and healthier. As the experiments continued, Ukon became more sadistic and intelligent, causing terror in the facility. Employees of New Hope Research Facility were the victims of attacks by the sires, causing many employees to become disillusioned and resign, with some even leaking information to the press of what was going on in the facility. Now, Private Sid Redburn, who was a guard at New Hope, he became disturbed by Ukon and the work at New Hope as well and he was able to escape the facility with research files and reveal them to Colonel Tolman about the work that was being done at New Hope. Sid Redburn, he was able to escape the facility and show that these guys, they're not finding a cure for Ruslung, they're creating monsters, mindless monsters, and this needs to be stopped. So Colonel Tolman alerted Chairman Monroe and led the coalition to investigate, discovering the rumours about child imprisonment, Torture and unethical experimentation at New Hope was actually true. So, the facility was then shut down and all involved were indicted. So, following the shutdown of New Hope Research Facility, a fringe political party within the Monroe administration contacted Dr. Niles Sampson. They believed that Dr. Niles' work to end both Ruslung and the Pendulum Wars and offered to relocate him and his work to a secret facility in Mount Kadar. So, Niles, he agreed but he was unable to request vehicle transportation in order to not let Chairman Monroe know of their actions. So Ukon, along with the other sires and Mira, walked to Mount Kadar on foot with the remaining loyal scientists of New Hope during the night in the snow. So at the Mount Kadar laboratory, Ukon continued to grow in intelligence and Niles continued his work by combining the embryonic stem cells of Mira with the DNA of the sires creating the first locust hybrid which was known as the matriarch. So as a female, the matriarch was able to reproduce and gave birth to the locust horde. So just like Ukon, the drones were intelligent. Additionally, they were able to be controlled through the hive mind as it was discovered that all locusts shared a psychomagnetic link to each other and mirror. 
This allowed them to communicate telepathically and allowed Mira to be able to control them remotely. And following the creation of the Locust Horde, Dr. Torres, who I mentioned previously, impregnated Mira and she gave birth to a human daughter who was known as Reina. And this is really important in what actually happens next and how that ties into Ukon's story as well. Now, it was discovered that Reina actually inherited many of Mira's abilities, including her connection to the hive mind. However, Dr. Torres feared his own daughter would be experimented on and fled the facility with her. So they got out of there and Niles and his cronies, they were unable to recapture her and Niles actually had to lie to Mira and said that Reina had died during the escape attempt. So Mira, of course, she couldn't believe her eyes, you know. That was her daughter at the end of the day. So Mira grew a hatred for the humans and empathy for the locust, her children. Of course, even though Reina was her child, the locusts were her children as well. As the locust longed for independence and the locust did not want to be tortured any longer. So Mira, along with the locust drone Srak, then led the locust horde to rise up and slaughter all of the scientists in the facility. So Mira, Srak, and of course Ukon and the remaining locust managed to escape the facility and gain their independence. So of course it was Mira, Srak, Ukon who was the sire that retained his mental capacity and the first generation of locust who escaped the facility and went into the hollow. So at a certain point Ukon came to learn many aspects of science such as genetics, engineering and biology. Ukon actually inherited the scientific knowledge of Dr. Niall Samson from Queen Mira and he became one of the most intelligent members of the Locust Horde and became a gifted scientist. Like I said before, he retained his mental capacity, he learned a lot from Queen Mira regarding Dr. Niall Sampson's scientific knowledge and he came to learn many other aspects of science as well. So to progress the Locust Horde, Ukon genetically engineered many of the indigenous creatures of the Hollow as he believed it was the future of the Locust Horde. Among his creations were the Brumak which he bred from smaller native apes of the hollow and created the armor for the hollow creatures that the locust horde used as well. Ukon also designed the helmet technology that allowed the locust to control these hollow creatures because without these helmets the hollow creatures would become rogue and just as dangerous to the locust as they would be to their enemies. Ukon also ordered the capture of humans from the surface to use them for genetic experiments and Ukon would then test their strength and abilities by placing them in the fighting pit. So like I said, this guy was sadistic. And due to his ingenuity and genius, Queen Mira actually invited him to the Locust Council for Scientific Affairs. So he was the go-to Locust for Scientific Affairs and the Queen would consult Ukon in those matters. And just a bit about the Locust Council itself. So the Locust Council was the inner circle of the Locust Horde. The council was organized during the Lambert War and was based in the Royal Palace of Nexus. The council was held by the highest members of the Locust Horde and deliberated to Queen Mira on the Horde's current state of political, military, scientific and religious affairs. So of course Ukon was there for scientific affairs. So by 7 BE the Lambent War began, so seven years before Emergence Day took place. Ukon acted as chief scientist for the Locust Horde and his studies involved machinery, weaponry and genetic engineering. Ukon used recycled materials from the surface and supplied the locust with modified weapons against the Lambent. Keita Vrol, who was the high priest of the Locust Horde and who Queen Mira consulted on all religious matters to do with the Locust Horde, saw this as blasphemy. But Ukon, who appeared to be agnostic or atheist, saw the modified creatures as the future for the Horde. Ketavrol scorned Ukon for having corrupted the corpser, that was of course a hollow creature, with machinery. Ukon stated that corrupted machinery was the future of the locust and that Ketavrol was stuck in a long dead era and that once he is gone, the locust would finally be freed from his antiquated beliefs. And at some point during the seventh cycle of the Lambert War, Voldkarn discovered a deformed corpser which had a missing leg and decided to nurture it, calling it the Shibboleth. Voldkarn then requested for Ukon to help mend and modify the shibboleth. So Ukon not only devised a metal leg for the shibboleth, but he also modified it with armor plating, troikas, emulsion bombs, and designed it with the ability to expel nemesis and diggers, and to breathe fire. So Ukon, he was an absolute genius. 
and of course he had his own laboratory as well which we'll break down right now. So Ukon had his own private research laboratory and it was located within Nexus in the inner hollow of Mount Kadar. It was here where many of the hollow creatures were genetically altered and weaponized for the Locust army. Ukon's laboratory was constructed along with the construction of Nexus in order to aid the Locust Horde in any scientific endeavors as Ukon was a genius and learned from the greatest geneticist and scientists known to Sarah during the New Hope Research Facility and the Mount Kadar Laboratory. And then we fast forward to arguably the most well-known moment of the Gears of War franchise, Emergence Day. So, while not present on the surface when the Locust Horde emerged, Ukon's creations were and aided in the killing of billions of humans on Emergence Day. Uzil Ram also agreed to his deal with Ukon and established a quota of live humans to be captured and experimented on. In the following months, Ukon began to perform recon missions on surface and due to this, the Coalition High Command was able to document Ukon and discover that he was the Locust's geneticist responsible for creating the creatures that aid the Locust army. So Ukon did abandon his Nexus laboratory to other laboratories on the surface. It is unknown what had become of Ukon's laboratory since his departure and eventual death in 1 AE or if he was ever replaced as scientist for the Locust Horde. Regardless, the laboratory was destroyed 14 years after Emergence Day when the coalition of ordered governments sunk to Sinto City in order to flood the Hollow and drown the Locust and Lambent during Operation Hollow Storm. Nexus was completely destroyed by seawater, as was Ukon's lab. But unfortunately for Ukon, he died at the hands of Gabe Diaz and his squad when they figured through Sid Redburn, who I mentioned earlier on in the video, who had a history with Ukon, that the only way to kill Ukon was to jam up his healing process with the cytostatic gas grenades. Ukon attempted to heal himself with the immunity booster, but he was still suffering the effects of the earlier cytostatic gas grenade, and Michaela warned that she had more if they needed it. Ukon proclaimed that they would never stop all of his creations, and that the Locust would survive and win as humanity was weak and inferior. But Ukon was cut off mid-sentence by Reyna shooting him in the head with a snub pistol. And of course, with his regenerative powers weakened by the grenade, Ukon was unable to heal himself and was killed instantly by the shot. Ukon was a dedicated and skilled engineer and geneticist who believed his inventions and creations were the future of the Locust. Ukon longed to see his creations rise and achieve a desired outcome. But as a scientist, he was always aware that there was room for improvements. As I said previously, Ukon was responsible for the Locust Horde's use of many hollow creatures and he had also created his masterpiece, which was known as the Hydra. And he did this through mutating Reavers, who were also another one of the hollow creatures. And he also experimented on many Locust troops such as Locust Drones and Locust Cantus, which resulted in the Locust Disciple and the Locust Zealot. Ukon harnessed the power of emulsion to create these enhanced troops, but it is unknown as to why Ukon would harness the power of emulsion, knowing that emulsion was the sole reason as to why the Lambent existed, why he had Ruslong in the first place, and what of course forced the Locust to invade the surface. Also, Ukon was always eager to acquire any new technology from the surface, believing it would advance his work and that of the Locust. A prime reason why he supported Ram and Scourge in their plan to invade the surface of Sera and attack humanity. Ram and Scourge noted that Ukon was much more of a visionary compared to his fellow council members and like other Locust leaders, Ukon considered humans too soft and frail to inherit the world, while his creations and the Locust were the only ones fit to rule Sera. Furthermore, he took sadistic delight in torturing, experimenting or murdering humans who were at his mercy. Due to Ukon's more scientific viewpoint, he possessed little respect for anything religious, making him agnostic or atheist. He often clashed with Keith of Roll, who was the high priest of the Trinity of Worms, as he believed that ingenuity and automation was the future of the Locust, not worshipping the Riftworm gods. Keith of Roll saw the creatures of the Hollow as sacred beings, whereas Ukon saw them as tools to improve and use in the field. Thus, Ukon had no qualms in creating new creatures of the Hollow or weaponizing them, of course, much to Keith of Roll's fury. And as one of the oldest members of the Locust species, Ukon had full knowledge of what he and his kind really were. But the memories of New Hope remained fresh in his thoughts, 
whereas I'd assume many of the next generations of Locust wouldn't have had the full knowledge of the Locust race and their history. Also, Ukon recognised Major Sid Redburn and taunted him on the atrocities he witnessed at New Hope and how the Cog ironically created that which is destroying humanity, because of course the Locust were created by the Cog, unfortunately. Due to, like I said at the start of the video, Nile Sampson being relocated to Mount Kadar due to a fringe political party in the Monroe administration. And of course, Ukon did die in 1 AE, so one year after Emergence Day. But his creatures, they lasted the whole Locust War. His experimentations, his weapons, etc. They lasted throughout the whole Locust War. And let's dive deep into the Locust lore. So firstly, let's talk about the Locust military ranking. So right at the top, you'd of course have Queen Mira. She is the boss. The Locust Horde serve her. And she is of course number one. And then we have the military. So the highest rank is Uzil, which means High General. And an example of this would of course be General Ram. And then below that, we have the rank Zamil, which is just General. And an example of this would be Zamil Khan. And then we have Theron. So Therons are commanders. And of course, these are Theron guards. And then below that we have Krav, which is captain. And an example of that would be Krav Jamad. And then the rank below that would be Vold, which would be a lieutenant. And an example of this would be Vold Ram before Emergence Day, when he had his own blight of locust drones and boomers. And this was during the Lambent War. And then we also have Verl, which is sergeant. And an example of this would be Verl Jamad before E Day. So this was before Jamad was promoted to Krav. And Verl Jamad at the time was in Vold Ram's blight. And then below that we have Marg, which is private. An example of this would be Marg Prax, who were just a locust drone, just your standard locust drone really. And a lot of the locust standard drones would be Margs, so that's the private rank there. And then we also have Religious, so we would have Kita, which is High Priest. An example of this would be Kita Scourge. And then we'd also have the Acolytes, who are of course the Cantus Monks. One thing to note is that the Cantus Monks, they are actually field commanders as well, as they bolster and inspire the Locust drones and other Locust troops. So you can say in a way that they are the same rank as Theron, because they are both field commanders. And another thing to note is that after the death of General Ram during the Light Mass Offensive, Kita Scourge acted as a High Priest and as the High General. So Kita Scourge during Operation Hollow Storm, he was Uzil, but he was Kita as well. But we just knew him as Kita Scourge really. And then we also had the lead scientist Ukon. He doesn't really fit into the military. He was just like political. He had a place in the Locust Council. But he would have had his own blights of Locust drones. And enhanced Locust troops that he was working and experimented on. Such as the Zealots and the Disciples. So that's Ukon right there as well. So those were the Locust military ranks that were used before Emergence Day. And of course throughout the Locust War. But after the sinking of Jacinto City. When the Savage Locust were created they seemed to reject the Locust military ranking. So the Savage Locust, they were former members of the Locust Horde who survived the flooding of the Hollow and they reverted into a feral state without the guidance of their queen. When the Jacinto city was sunk underground by the coalition of ordered governments, the entire inner Hollow was flooded, killing a majority of the Locust Horde by drowning before they could evacuate the Hollow. So those on the surface, they survived and they splintered into two factions. So you had the Locust without Queen Mira's guidance. They reverted to a tribal and nomadic way of life. While the Locust guarding Queen Mira, they maintained guidance and direction, becoming the Queen's Guard. So of course the Queen's Guard, they maintained the military ranking, but the Savage Locust didn't. The Savage Locust were less organised and were without a hive mentality. The Savage Locust appeared to follow some of the original ways of the Locust. However, there are many differences between the two factions. While the Locust Horde was organised and each class had a unique purpose on the battlefield, the Savage Locust appeared to follow no organisation and they use any weapons they can scavenge. They also appeared to follow no hierarchy as both Savage Cantus and Therons seemed to act as cannon fodder, something that only drones and boomers did in the Queen's army. So in the Queen's Guard, the Locust Horde's Theron Guards and the Cantus, like I said, they would have acted as field commanders. And of course, their own guards, they would be regarded as the elite Locust troops. But the Savage Locust, they didn't seem to follow any form of hierarchical structure with troops such as the Savage Boomer, Savage Grenadier, Savage Cantus, Savage Theron, etc. all being at the same level. 
And despite the abandonment of several of the Locust's ways, the Savage Locust still kept a deep hatred for humanity and would kill any human being who dared enter their territory and they would often use their charred corpses as a warning for any intruders. Also in the Locust military, so the Queen's Guard of Locust soldiers, some of the subclasses would actually have different rankings as well. So the Locust drones, they were of course the foot soldiers of the Locust horde. They had different classes specialising in different forms of combat and they were the standard infantry of the Locust horde. But the Locust grenadiers were a rank up from the drones, they were the Locust shock troopers and they were stronger and more aggressive than the Locust drones. But the Theron guards, who were of course the commanders, they were higher ranking than the grenadiers, they represented the elite Locust troops, they were head and shoulders above the drones in terms of equipment, intelligence and training. So the Theron Guards, they were the elite form of Locust troops. Now the Locust Grenadiers, they would have different rankings in their subclass as well. So of course you'd have the standard Locust Grenadiers, they were the Locust Shock Troopers and they were stronger and more aggressive than the drones. And then you'd have the Locust Grenadier Elites, who were the higher rank of the standard Grenadier. They could take and deal a lot more damage and they appeared to be much more seasoned combat operatives compared to the standard grenadier. And then you'd have the Locust Ravagers. Now the Locust Ravagers were the highest ranking subclass of grenadier. They made up of the most brutally strong and tremendously resilient grenadiers. Now the elite Locust troops, their own guards, they actually had their own ranking as well. So you'd have the standard Theron Guards who were the commanders, then you'd have the Theron Sentinel. So when you'd see a pack of Theron Guards, the Theron Sentinel would be the leader of that small team. And then you'd have the Theron Elites. Now this was a co-organisation of the Locust Therons. They specifically trained and worked under the command of General Ram, who of course was the Uzil at the time, serving as his chosen warriors and sometimes loyal lieutenants. So that's Locust military ranking explained. But we also have the Locust religion. Now the Locust Horde's religion revolved around the worship of worms. Yes, worms. <laughs> so the Rift Worms and the Rock Worms are viewed as highly significant creatures in the Locust religious texts. The Trinity of Worms was the symbol and title of the Locust Horde's religion, symbolising and revering the Rift Worms as gods. So the Rift Worms were a species of massive subterranean worms, reaching a confirmed maximum length of 10 miles and width of half a mile. They were the largest and oldest animal known to have existed on the planet Sarah. They were semi-intelligent creatures capable of century-long hibernation. The Riftworms created the Hollow, which was a complex underground network of tunnels by burrowing through the crust of Sarah. Leaving a rich manure in their path, it fertilized the soil and created life within the Hollow, which was later termed as the Hollow by the humans and it created life underground. An ecology of plant and animal life evolved in the hollow, with many of the creatures being reptilian in nature, which was just like the riftworm. And among the life forms created in the hollow by the riftworm was emulsion, because emulsion was actually a living organism. It was a parasitic fungus that was capable of infecting, mutating, and possessing any living organism. And just a side note that in the Temple of the Trinity, there were pictures of three riftworms. But we of course only saw one Riftworm, which was during Operation Hollow Storm. So it remains unknown what actually happened to the remaining two Riftworms on Sarah. Their fate remains unknown after the flooding of the Hollows and the Emotion Countermeasure Weapons activation. Now it could be possible that they drowned in the flooding of the Hollows, since they wouldn't have actually been awake to escape. But to be honest, the anatomy of the other two Riftworms may have been a lot different compared to the Gears 2 Riftworm. So we shouldn't really jump to that conclusion. So we don't know if the other two Riftworms are still alive or not. I just really hope they expand the lore when it comes to those two Riftworms in the future. And of course there were three Riftworms. That's why the Locust religion was called the Trinity of Worms. Only three Riftworms have been known to exist. And at some point in the Gears of War timeline, all three Riftworms went dormant in the hollow. So during the Locust War, one of the Riftworms was awakened by the light mass bomb that the Coalition of Board Governments used to destroy the Outer Hollows. So this Riftworm was awakened and was used by Keter Scourge as a weapon of mass destruction capable of sinking entire cities. So the last known Riftworm was killed in 14 AE. Now the Cantus Monks are the religious priests of the Locust and Aracast level. 
So the Cantus monks had the Cantus scrolls. So these were ancient Cantus writings that are the code of the Cantus. The scrolls contained verses and mantras that explained how to communicate with the rift worms and the rock worms. With the rulers of the Nexus Plates tablet being Locust's main religious tome, which told the history of the hollows, explaining how the rift worms burrowed underground and created the vast underground network and left their waste behind, which fertilized the soil of the surface of Sarah. Also, another thing to note is that the Cantus monks were an ancient species that lived in the hollow long before the actual locust horde. So we can assume they actually knew and studied the history of the hollow really well, but their backstory is still pretty unknown as to why and how they were recruited into the locust military in the first place, and if they were welcome into the locust drones and mirror at first when they entered the hollow. So locust horde's main religious book was the rulers of Nexus Plates, are also known as the Logs Tablets, and one copy of the tome was discovered by Delta One during Operation Hollow Storm. And according to the High Priests of the Logs Horde, the Sires are also revered as holy figures, and they are seen as divine incubators evolved from the Rift Worms. And some copies of the Cantus Scrolls are used with human skin fitted in between the rollers, which is absolutely crazy, and with the religious text written on them with ink. So moving away from the Locust religion, let's talk about the Locust language. So the Locust had their own writing system as well, which was referred to as the Locust Runes. So the Locust Runes were based on a lexigram used by scientists of the Mount Kadar laboratory to communicate with the original generation of Locust. The system consisted of symbols which represented individual letters and ideograms that represented full words based on the Tyran language. The writing system's alphabet contained 26 symbols for 26 letters and the numbering system contained 10 numbers that was represented by 10 symbols. Now there was also a computerized version of the Locust writing system which could be seen on the Locust computer terminals. These symbols are cleaner and more identifiable than the handwritten symbols and the most notable examples of the computerized Locust alphabet are found on Locust computer terminals and the Locust invasion map. As for the relationship with human languages and writing systems, there are 21 confirmed ideograms that represented Tyran words. As a spoken language, the official language of the Locust Horde was also Tyran. However, the Locust Horde created several words in their own languages. Many of them were associated with a Tyran word, but when directly translated, is meant as something else. For instance, the rankings in the Locust army, such as Marg, Verl, Vold, Krav, Zamil and Uzil are meant as Private, Sergeant, Lieutenant, Captain, General and High General. However, the direct translations of the Locust ranks starting from the bottom are Virgin, Dirty, Battered, Bloodied, Gored and Unbroken. Now the Locust also had a calendar system which was their way of basically depicting the seasons and months on Sarah. So the Locust's calendar system was based on emulsion flowing through the hollows. Within the calendar system, there are 12 seasons, each with opposites. Because you gotta remember that this is the planet Sarah, not Earth, right? So the days on Sarah are longer, there are different seasons, etc. So each full rotation of the calendar was referred to as a cycle and matched that of the regular Saren year. So one cycle of the Locust calendar was also one year of the Saren calendar. So the translation of the symbols clockwise, so these are basically the 12 seasons for the Locust calendar system, which is Queen, Fire, Drone, Leviathan, Danger, Nemesis, Emulsion, Water, Human, Krill, Secure, and Cedar. So every season has its opposite as well. So the queen season has the opposite of emulsion. The fire season's opposite is water. The drone season opposite is human. The leviathan season's opposite is krill. The danger season's opposite is secure. And the nemesis season's opposite is cedar. Additionally, the Locust Horde had many objects to represent their society, culture and religion as well as their people. So Queen Mira had her own symbol, which all members of her guard always carried with them. But the Savage Locust appeared to have rejected this symbol. The Locust also produced jewellery such as emblems that are referred to just as the Locust emblem. Damon Red, in an intelligence report, theorised that the Locust either kept track of their fallen soldiers, just like the Coalition of Ordered Governments did, 
or they just had a bad taste in jewellery. The Locust also produced human finger necklaces, so yeah, these guys did have poor taste in jewellery for sure. Now I also want to talk about Locust military's tactics and strategies. So despite the drone's tendency to charge right into battle, the Locust are far from mindless. In fact, it can be argued that many of the high-ranking leaders of the Locust Horde were considered to be geniuses in terms of military strategy. The assumption that Locust are little more than mindless beasts greatly hindered the COG's initial efforts to combat them. Now, while the individual drone's intelligence was, in fact, questionable, prominent Locust commanders such as Khan, General Ram and Scourge displayed great cunning and strategy. The gears in the battlefield often attributed unexpected and surprising tactics from the Locust. Now, while the Locust did use a variety of strategies to keep their enemies off balance, their most infamous tactic was the use of emergence holes, or also known as E-holes, to deliver their forces directly into battle. Since Emergence Day, these holes have proven themselves to be the one thing the COG could never predict or prevent, giving the Locust superior advantage over their enemies, as they could never predict where or when E-holes would emerge. The emergence holes, in addition to quickly delivering their forces, had a heavy psychological effect on enemies since they allowed the locusts to attack nearly anywhere at any time without warning. Also, though the locusts made their own weapons, armor, and vehicles, they also took their enemies' weapons and vehicles as spoils of war. Among the weapons they used from slain enemies were Lancer assault rifles, Nasher shotguns, longshot sniper rifles and sometimes modified them with crude attachments and paint jobs to create weapons like the Breach Shot. They gathered all available civilian and military hardware from the cities that they invaded. The supplies and hardware are collected and the auto ports are salvaged from the wreckage. So when it comes to the Locust weaponry, the Locust weaponry is fairly conventional, with a few notable exceptions. Both versions of the Hammerburst rifle work in much the same way as a human-made rifle would and the Baltok pistol has a standard revolver design. Others are deviations from standard human designs, such as the Boomshot Grenade Launcher. The Locust also favour the use of captured human weapons, such as the Nasher Shotgun and the Lancer Assault Rifle. Certain weapons like the Torquebow possess a more unique design, however. So the Torquebow is unlike any contemporary human weapon. Its design is based around a crossbow, but combines a mechanical action that gives the arrow rotational energy. This gives the arrow a longer effective range and vastly improved accuracy over a standard bow and arrow. The arrowhead contains an explosive emulsion charge as evidenced by the glowing of the arrowheads, which makes it an incredibly powerful weapon. So this design is completely unique to the Locust Horde. The Locust grenades are also very distinctive. For instance, the ink grenade is especially notable because it combines the unique weapon design of the Locust with their use of their species variants, because the ink grenade is actually a baby nemesis housed in a grenade casing. Due to their subterranean existence and until emergence day, the Locust Horde had developed technology that is vastly different to human technology. Notably, they make use of living creatures in the place of machines. The hollows of Sera are populated with an abundance of large animal life, and Locusts have domesticated many species for use as vehicles and war beasts. For instance, the corpses are used to dig the tunnels that the Locusts use to travel beneath the planet's surface. The Brumax carry Troika turrets and a rocket launcher into battle. The Cedars are used as artillery and jamming devices. The Reavers are used as airborne gunships and light infantry support roles. Nemesis are ammunition for the Cedars and a component of certain explosives. Mangler fish drive their gunboats and an unidentified insectoid creature propels their processing barges. And on the surface, the locust use gas barges propelled by an enormous floating creature as transportation and fire support platforms. However, the locusts do have some machine technology. There are levers and switches all over Nexus that open doors and activate cover. There are also lifts and a cable car system that appear to be driven by mechanical means. So despite seeming primitive, the Locusts have a considerable grasp of computer technology. There are numerous computer terminals dotted throughout the inner hollows and nexus. These computers are used for a variety of functions, such as cataloging prisoners and as a broadcast system. The Locusts also seem to have a grasp of basic electronics and have invented their own version of the microphone. 
However, there does not seem to be any evidence of robotics in the hollow though. But it has been confirmed from COG DNA analysis that Brumax have been bred from smaller native apes. So it is unknown what kind of technology was used to actually do this or how it was even done. But it shows that the locusts have mastered artificial selection and they used it for their war effort. It is not currently known whether other locust creatures came about by the same means or if they are actually natural occurrences. But one thing is for sure that there were many locust hollow creatures that actually did live in the hollow prior to locust horde's existence. It's just the case that the locust horde bred, manipulated and used a lot of these hollow creatures for transportation, for weaponry and so on. And the locust horde had various forms of specialised armour for combat roles. These range from stripped down armour for the grenadier and grenadier elites so they can manoeuvre better in close quarters combat all the way to helmets that can aid snipers in killing gears. But I'll be breaking down all these different types of drones that are used for different types of combat in a future video. I think we found our locust stronghold. Nexus. Nexus was the capital of the Locust Horde. Located near the centre of the Inner Hollow under Mount Kadar, Nexus was apparently founded by Mira and the Locust Horde following the Mount Kadar laboratory uprising in the mid-Pendulum War era. Nexus was established as the centre and source of the Locust civilization, as the definition of Nexus literally defines as a means of connection, as in the centre and connection of the Locust Horde. The capital was constructed out of the rock and recycled materials that were dumped into the hollow by the humans as scrap. Nexus inspired the locusts to create their own religion, the Trinity of Worms, and compelled them to create their own divisions of science, technology and industry. The centre of Nexus was the royal palace, where Queen Mira and the locust council resided. While the locust horde possessed other tunnel cities, Nexus was the only one known by name. So firstly, how did Nexus come about? What led Mira to lead her children, the Locust, into the Hollow? Now the caverns of the mountain called Kadar were initially occupied by a fringe political party within the coalition of ordered governments. They built a secret facility for scientist Dr. Nile Samson to continue his work on finding a cure for the fatal lung condition known as rust lung. This was after his work was shut down at the New Hope Research Facility for unethical experimentation. His work involved splicing sick children with Ruslung with the DNA of the indigenous creatures of the Hollow, creating the Sires. One of his other test subjects was a child named Mira, who exhibited a genetic immunity to emulsion. Her embryonic stem cells were then fertilized with Sire DNA to create the first of the Locust Horde. However, the Locust Horde began to feel imprisoned by scientists, to which Mira greatly empathized with as of course they were ultimately her children. Mira also ended up having a baby girl with scientist Dr. Torres. Mira was led to believe from Niles that her human daughter, Raina, had died. But in fact, Dr. Torres had escaped the facility with her. Mira was of course infuriated and she led the locusts to rebel and kill the scientists. So Mira escaped the facility with the locust and assumed her role as queen, with the locust becoming an independent race. Queen Mira led her people deeper into the caverns of Mount Kadar and found what would become the cradle of their civilization, Nexus. A large stalactite stood over an underground lake of emulsion and was carved out into the royal palace for Queen Mira. The cliffs surrounding the palace were transformed into a city for the Locust Horde by repurposing disposed human tools and carving out the architecture from the rocks and stone. The Locust designed a religion and culture based off the Riftworms and Rockworms believing them to be a source of life in the hollow. The architecture would later also be inspired by worms as well. The rest of the city surrounded the Emulsion Lake and featured homes, military installations, the Temple of the Trinity and Ukon's laboratory. A series of turrets and fortress walls which surrounded the city provided additional security. The Nexus Highway served as the only entrance and exit to Nexus, and the pathway was utilised to deploy thousands of locust troops at a time. Now just to quickly clarify, we know about Nexus all the way since Gears of War 2 when we saw it for the first time. It was also mentioned in the novels, but the origins of Nexus was retconned in Gears 5 along with the origins of the Locust in black and white, as before this there wasn't much clarity. 
So what does this mean? This means that they retconned Nexus to be built in the mid Pendulum War era, which may have been between 30 to 50 years before Emergence Day. Now to give my opinion on this, this part of the lore doesn't make the most sense to me, as it means the Locusts didn't live underground for very long, and also seem to have built Nexus very quickly. But of course it can be argued that the Locusts were vast in numbers, and built Nexus by using the vast numbers of drones and boomers, and used the hollow creatures to assist. But what would make more sense to me, now this is just my opinion, would be to have the Cantus be an ancient species that were native to the hollow, and when the Locust Horde went underground, they took on the Cantus' religion of the Trinity of Worms, and the Cantus, they would have accepted the Locust, as the Locust Horde's predecessors were the Sires, and the Sires were seen in holy regard by the Cantus, as the Sires were created from the DNA of the indigenous creatures of the hollow, and that life in the hollow itself was created by the Riftworm, and therefore they saw the Riftworms as gods. Therefore, the Cantus being an ancient species would have meant the Cantus race building Nexus itself. But then when the Locust Horde arrived, they built the royal palace for their queen and some of the other locations which I'll break down. But let me know in the comments below of what you think of the retcon and my thoughts on how the lore could be tweaked to make more sense. So with Nexus as a whole and the discussion points out of the way, let's talk about the royal palace. Now the royal palace is the home of the Locust Queen. It is a building in the middle of the Emulsion Lake below Nexus. It has two elevators that run down the side of the structure and the palace is guarded by a garrison of palace guards, as well as a self-defense system. It is also home to the Reaver Pens, which was a section of the royal palace in which Reavers were kept. It was located behind the throne room across a large bridge, and it housed the vicious beasts when not in use by the Locust. The royal palace also had Bloodmount stables, which were the holding area for the blood mounts used by Locust Beast Riders. These stables were located at the bottom of the Locust Palace, and it appeared that in these stables, human heads were fed to the blood mounts for sustenance. There was also the council chambers located in the royal palace. This was where the Locust Council would notify the Queen on the Locust Horde's current state of political, military, scientific and religious affairs. And the Locust Council was the inner circle of the Locust Horde and was held by the highest members of the Locust Horde. And the royal palace itself looks like a large beehive which is actually a great symbolization showing how Mira was the queen bee and also compares the Locust Horde to similar hive-like insects that have a queen. Another known location in Nexus was the Locust Highway. Now the Locust Highway is the main network that allows the Locust Army to move freely around the hollows directly from the Locust capital city, Nexus. The highway is also the main entrance road to Nexus where Locust troops use it to travel from Nexus to any specific location. It's unknown how long it stretches or how many troops can be on it at once, but it is speculated to hold thousands if ever needed to. There are also paths that branch off the highway as well. Another known location in Nexus was the Temple of the Trinity. Now this was the main temple for the Trinity of Worms religion and the official residence of the Kita, the High Priest of the Locust Horde. Due to the Trinity being based on the ancient Rift Worms, the temple was designed to resemble their deity. The temple contains scripture on the nature of the Riftworms, the Horde and Emulsion and this was the main house of worship for the Locust Horde and the Keter would be the leader of the Trinity. The temple itself also had known locations, one example being the Inner Sanctum. There was also Ukon's laboratory which was the private research laboratory of the Locust geneticist Ukon which was also located within Nexus. It was here where many of the hollow creatures were genetically altered and weaponized for the Locust Army, as well as a means of reproduction for the Locust Horde. Ukon's laboratory was constructed along with the construction of Nexus in order to aid the Locust Horde in any scientific endeavors, as Ukon was a genius and learned from the greatest geneticist and scientist known to Sarah during the New Hope Research Facility and the Mount Kadar Laboratory. Ukon had members of the Locust occasionally emerge on the surface and capture humans to be experimented on. He would also go to extreme measures by placing two humans into a fighting pit to test their strength and capabilities. Ukon's laboratory was then charged with creating biomechanical weapons for the Locust army to fight against the Lambent during the Lambent War. It was here where Ukon created the Brumak and special creatures such as the Tempest, the personal mount of Queen Mira, as well as the Shibboleth which was the personal mount of Vold Khan, as well as other hollow creatures that he genetically engineered. 
Another location with a nexus was the Nexus Slaughterhouse, also known as the Rockworm Slaughterhouse. This was basically where rockworms, an indigenous cave creature, would be slaughtered by the locust butchers. The rockworm meat is taken from locust hunting parties, which would generally consist of one to two cantus with many locust. The cantus summon the rockworm from their caves, the locust kill it, the butcher chops it up and serves it to the locust, and the locust eat it. The locust could have also slaughtered other hollow creatures here, but what we do know is that the locust did love a good rockworm feast. Also, a side note is that the locust miner drones were responsible for creating new tunnels in the hollow and maintaining them, so they must have played a big role in constructing and maintaining new tunnel cities for the locust horde. As we know, the capital city was Nexus, but the locust did possess other cities throughout the hollow. But unfortunately for the locust, when the coalition of ordered governments sunk Jacinto City in order to flood the hollow, and drowned the Locust and Lambent during Operation Hollow Storm, Nexus was completely destroyed by seawater, as was the rest of the Hollow. So Locust drones, usually referred to as grubs by the Gears, are the foot soldiers of the Locust Horde. Completely loyal to their queen, the drones are willing to toss their lives away in a second to kill a single Gear, and many different classes of Locust drones specialise in different forms of combat within the Queen's Guard of the Locust Horde. So in this video I'm going to be explaining every Locust drone subclass within the Queen's Guard of the Locust Horde. So Locust drones are born and bred for combat, they are fearless even when outnumbered. There had been reports of Locust drones appearing on the surface of Sarah, stealing children and other humans decades before the Pendulum Wars, up until just before Emergence Day, these have turned into nothing more than fairy tales and urban legends. Drone anatomy is actually quite similar to humans at a first glance. They possess two arms, two legs, a pair of nostrils, two eyes, a digestive tract, a jaw filled with teeth, five digits on each hand, spinal cord and a rather normal looking torso, supported by a humanoid ribcage. Drones also seem to have a low tolerance for bright lights. So one of their main differences from humans is that all locust drones are covered in a thick white hide which has gone pale. This skin is practically rock hard in terms of durability, severely limiting the usage of cutting and slashing weapons against them. Now the Sirens actually discovered this on or soon after Emergence Day when they found that they were unable to defend themselves with their bayonets and combat knives. However, it has been known that if enough brute force was put behind it, a rifle mounted bayonet could easily skewer a locust drone. But eventually, it was demonstrated by the cog gear Tai Kaliso that chainsaws would be an excellent weapon to pierce through a locust drone skin, eventually, leading to the creation of the Mark II Lancer assault rifle, which were outfitted with chainsaw bayonets. Now, the male locust drones tended to be around 6 foot 7 on average, but there were notable locust drones who were much larger and taller. One example being General Ram, who was a mighty 10 foot tall, so he was a beast. And another example would be Ram's predecessor, Srak, who came in at 12 feet tall, so he was humongous. Now, it is unknown as to why some locust drones were much larger, but one of my assumptions could just be that, just like with humans, in rare instances some humans are much larger than your average humans due to a rare disorder resulting from increased levels of growth hormone. It could just be the same case with the drones, but that's just a theory. The female drones, however, were far more dangerous. They were called the Berserkers for their seemingly endless bouts of rage. Each female stood at an average height of 10 feet tall. They could smash through solid brick with little to no effort, and they were blind. Another one of their most distinctive traits is that they had incredibly durable armor plating, which rendered them virtually immune to small arms fire. However, high temperatures were known to temporarily soften these shells and make them more vulnerable to attack. Now, if you do want a full breakdown of the Berserkers, I do have a dedicated video explaining the Berserkers and their history in a video on my channel. So let's break down the Locust Drone subclasses where different Locust Drones would be used for different purposes within the Locust military. So to clarify, I will be talking about the standard Locust Drones in this video. So not the Grenadiers and not the Theron Guards. Neither will I be talking about the prominent Locust Drones in the Locust Army such as General Ram because I do have separate videos that explain them properly. I also won't be mentioning the Savage Locust, Swarm or Lambent factions as I have separate in-depth videos planned for them. So this is lore to do with the Queen's Guard of the Locust Drones. 
So with that out of the way, let's move to our first subclass, who are the Locust Beast Riders. Now the Beast Rider was a Locust drone that rode on a Bloodmount, Reaver or even the Brumac. So they were assigned to ride the hollow creatures that were tamed and used by the Locust. The Beast Rider either used a Hammerburst Assault Rifle or the Baltock Pistol, and the Beast Riders rode on top of Brumax and Reavers during the E-Day Assault. The Beast Rider was a dreaded enemy that inflicted heavy casualties on the Gears, and the Beast Riders tended to be part of the Cavalry Unit, and they would always wear their signature Beast Rider helmet. Next up we have the Bolters. Now the Bolters were a class of drone in the Locust Horde. Like their name suggests, they only wield a Baltock pistol and are very skilled in its use, so they were a specialist unit. Their name also suggests their speed, as they tend to dart around to rush and attack the humans. They tend to hide behind cover to reload and pop out to fire. Using such rapid tactics give them their name. They are easily distinguished from regular drones by their improved armour, which includes a full helmet and shoulder plates. We also have the Cyclops, who was a Loke's drone named for the monocular targeting helmet that they wear. Although the Cyclops was equipped with a Hammerburst Assault Rifle, their most infamous trait is their habit of looting human weaponry, which mainly involved the Mark II Lancers. From the Cyclops slaughtering fallen gears, they used the Lancers to deadly effect against their former owners, and they were really successful in doing so. They even came to terms in using the Lancer Chainsaw Bayonet, in which they would scream in laughter upon cutting up a gear soldier. So the Cyclops were like scavengers on the battlefield, and they were more so standard infantry just like the standard Locust drones. We also have the Locust Disciple, who was a ferocious Locust drone unleashed upon the coalition of odd governments during the early years of the Locust War. Now the lead scientist of the Locust Horde, Ukon, who was a mad scientist, he actually harnessed the power of emulsion to build his army. Resulting experiments with Locust drones led to the creation of the Deadly Disciple. Now the Disciples had grey skin with yellow emulsion bioluminescent veins. These enhanced drones formed the fierce and unrelenting front line of Ukon's army, and each Disciple wore an injection harness that delivered a continual flow of emulsion into their bodies, amplifying the power of their attacks and granting them increased resilience and strength. And when they were killed, they released the trapped emulsion within their bodies, turning the surrounding area into a toxic kill zone. Now it remains unknown as to why Ukon decided to inject emulsion into the Locust. Given the fact that the threat of Lambency was widely known amongst the Horde by the time Gears Tactics took place, which was one year after Emergence Day, because injecting these locusts with a mutagenic organism that infects the host against their own kind seems really counterproductive to the locust horde. But it is possible that the emulsion went through the light mass process, removing the deadly fungal spores from the emulsion. We also have the flame drones, and these were variants of drones that only appeared 6 weeks after emergence day, so they were actually very rare. The flame drones carried fuel tanks on their backs, attached to a Scorcher Flamethrower, similar to that of Flame Grenadiers and Flame Boomers. Now while they did carry a Scorcher Flamethrower and back-mounted fuel tanks, similar to the Flame Grenadier and the Flame Boomer, they did not wear the same helmet as them. Instead, they wore standard drone helmet variations. They also had less health than a Flame Grenadier, having the same health as a regular drone. And then we have the Locust Grappler. So the Grappler drone was the Locust Shock Trooper, used in boarding actions during the assault on Landown and the Siege of Jacinto. They appear to be like normal drones, with the exception of a unique helmet and grappling hook. This helmet may be used to help the grappler adjust to the rapid change of light from their home in the hollow to the surface, as they are only ever seen whenever they come out of openings, though it could also possess distance measuring equipment needed to judge how far to throw their grappling hooks. Grapplers are deployed in small strike teams and are often used for quick insertions on enemy positions or ambushes. Heavily fortified positions such as the deck of the Assault Derrick or the roof of multi-story buildings are not enough to stop their onslaught. They can quickly scale vertical surfaces with their grappling hooks and this also allows them to be used as very effective snipers. Being able to get to the highest points on the battlefield and they even carry the one shot on occasion. Next up we have the Locust Gunners. So the Gunners was a specialised type of Locust drone that are expert users of the Troika heavy machine gun. They are encountered manning Troika turrets in camps and settlements. Gunners actually wear scuba-like helmets that protect them from a variety of shots. They are usually found in Locust bases protecting a camp and not on an open battlefield due to the difficulty in Troika transport. 
Therefore, they are mostly found in levels in the Hollow or Nexus. When Gunners are alone, they pose a low to medium threat. However, when they are supported by other Locusts, they can be very deadly by which they force you into cover while flanked by drones. Despite being a Troika specialist, some Gunners or at least drones wearing Gunner helmets attack you with hand bursts and act like regular drones if forced to abandon their Troikas. And they often come with a spotter who will alert the Gunner to a COG presence. So if the spotter is killed, the gunner will no longer constantly fire its troika as it will not know where you are. Instead, there will be a 1-2 to two second wait before they fire at you, which can be used to fire first. So let's talk about the locust spotters since we're on the topic. Now the spotter seems to be a locust drone who looks out for a gunner who is manning a troika. And we know this because in Gears 1, Marcus says there's a spotter on the right, to which Min responds, take him out first. So there are always two locusts at a troika, one manning the troika and the other can be assumed as the spotter. In Gears of War 2 sometimes a drone will man a large spotlight, blinding gears as well as making nearby drones and gunners aware of your presence. This can be assumed to be a spotter. They generally have lower health and will operate the spotlight much like a troika but without the constant hail of bullets. They wear standard drone armor with their signature spotter helmet and are a specialist unit within the locust army. Next up we have the locust miners. So the miner drones were a class of locust who mined ore and other resources for the horde. They were responsible for creating new tunnels in the hollow and maintaining them. Now these miners are one of the most important class of drones as they are responsible for the acquisition of resources to manufacture the locust war machine. They may also be important as builders that construct the architecture of the locust nexus. Miners are also responsible for directing corpses on where to dig as well as providing the locust army on intelligence and logistics to create strategically sound emergence holes. They wear a special helmet which protects them from harm and due to the fact that they are not seen in combat it is possible that miners are non-combatants and act as a logistical reserve and they also wear standard drone armor along with their signature miner helmet. Next up we have the Rager. So the Rager was a subspecies of the Locust drone and the Rager was a specialized Locust breed that appeared during the Locust War and they were known for their ability to metamorphose into monstrous forms. The Ragers would have grey skin when unraged but they would have black skin with orange red bioluminescent flesh when enraged. The rather leith and unassuming Ragers were known to carry the breach shot rifle, but they were far more dangerous when enraged. When angered, they would go into a state of metamorphosis due to emotion build up inside them. I am planning to do a more detailed separate lore video of the Rager, as they are very very interesting Logs troops with a more complex physiology, so stay tuned for that video. And then finally we have the Locust Sniper Drones. So the Loke Sniper Drones, they were expert marksmen who can always be found wielding the long shot sniper rifle and less commonly the mortar. They highly resembled Loke's drones despite their goggles and they use infrared thermal goggles to help locate enemies and they occasionally wear helmets as well. They use cover such as buildings and alleyways and they can almost always be found at a vantage point. These elite shock troops are feared by COG gears but they are always as ruthless as drones, however this doesn't make them less bloodthirsty as they snipe any gear in their way. So boomers were large, brutish, markedly less intelligent locusts who earned their reputation as the locust horde's heavy weapon specialists. Several variations appeared over the course of the locust war and the lambent pandemic. While unintelligent, boomers are extremely dangerous enemies to deal with as their boom shot can deal a lot of damage or even kill the player in harder difficulties. And they can take a lot of punishment before they die. Fortunately, players can easily tell when they are about to attack as the boomers yell before firing their weapon. Boomers were humanoid in shape but were much taller than the average human or drone. 
Being at least 8 feet tall, boomers were also bristled with muscle and they were very fat, making them considerably thicker than other humanoids. Despite this, they were able to move at very surprising speeds. It is unknown how boomers actually came about, whether they are a special breed of drones or drones that suffer from defects, but it is not currently conclusive. What is known is that they are heavy and physically very powerful, capable of lifting an entire gear with one hand and crushing their heads. Their inner anatomy is presumed to be similar to that of a locust drones as they showed no improvement nor degradation in vision or hearing. On the other hand, boomers were considerably tougher to kill than their smaller brethren, able to survive a long shot round to the head. So when it comes to the locust boomers armour, the large boomer armour is an armour set piece meant only for the boomers due to their large size. Unlike drone armour, boomer armour is made primarily of thick metal plates rather than the more common and flexible leather pieces. The chest piece of the boomer armour is connected via two elongated circles like those of the COGS trooper armour, suggesting that the locust got the designs from the COG during the pendulum wars. The chest piece left the belly exposed but the thick hide and fat of a boomer made such exposure irrelevant. The back of the chest piece had a lock system, which allowed specialised boomers like the flame boomer to attach an emulsion fuel tank. The shoulder pads were relatively small in contrast to the boomer's size, whilst the leg guards were thick and heavy. All boomer variants wore the same armour, owing to its versatility and protection, the possible exception being the savage boomer, which had a protected neck guard and an ammo belt to protect himself from a weapon malfunction of his diggers. Boomers were among the least sophisticated members of the Locust Horde, being larger, tougher and markedly less intelligent than other Locusts. Despite this, Boomers are incredibly determined and fierce during combat, but luckily for the Sirens, this came with a fortunate side effect, a rather peculiar inability to listen to reason. Boomers often charged headlong into battle with little regard for their own well-being. But despite this, Boomers could actually learn to use different sorts of equipment on the battlefield and some even managed to use strategies against their enemies. Some of these were presumably the Mauler Elites, which were some of the most fearsome soldiers of the Locust Horde, killing battalions of Onyx Guards with ease and even being part of General Ram's squad during the evacuation of Elima. One of the signature trademarks of the boomers is that the boomers of all types often shout a single word respective of their weapon. For example, the boomers with the boom shots would shout BOOM! So let's move on to the different boomer variations. So first up, we have the mauler. So the mauler was a boomer variant of course, equipped with a boom shield and a horned helmet that together give them considerable cover from enemy fire. The boom shield they carry can be used by the player if of course they kill the mauler and all maulers carry an explosive flail which they run forward wielding and is very very deadly at close range. When the maulers are shot they will flinch and deploy their shield to absorb the bullets making chest shots more difficult. Headshots are more advisable due to its large head but requires at least two shots from a long shot. Now the mauler subclass actually has some variations as well so we'll break these down as well. So one of the Mauler variations is the Unarmoured Mauler. Now this is only seen once currently in Gears Media. So the Unarmoured Mauler served under the Scarred Cantus as part of the Locust forces during the Second Battle of Jelaine. This Mauler was stronger, larger and more muscular than an average Mauler, being able to charge through a wall of solid concrete without even getting a scratch on him. And under the orders of the Scarred Cantus, he ambushed Marcus Phoenix, knocking Marks out cold with one punch, but he was killed by a grenade trap set up by Damon Baird and Alex Brand. Now the unarmoured mauler, he had tremendous strength and it was actually similar to that of a berserker, so imagine that, being able to smash through a solid concrete wall with just his fists, and he did so without even hurting himself at all. He also seemed to be a bit more intelligent than a regular mauler, to at least some degree as he was able to think quickly by using a large piece of steel as a makeshift shield in the middle of combat to protect himself. Unlike average maulers, he did not wear any upper body armour, although he did still wear the standard issue mauler helmet. He also did not carry a boom shield, but he still did carry an explosive flail. 
Now, just a side note, I think this boomer variation, the unarmored mauler, is the strongest boomer type there is when it just comes to the pure strength and biology of the locust soldier, the unarmored mauler. So I do wish we actually get to see more of this guy in the future, whether it's comics or games, whatever it may be. I think this locust deserves a bit more love in my opinion. And the other mauler variation was the mauler elite. So the mauler elite was a unique, more powerful class of the locust mauler, which was seen after Emergence Day. And the Mauler Elite was equipped with a horned gothic style helmet and a boom shield that was actually modified. The Mauler Elite was a deadly foe on the battlefield. Their shields would also deflect fire, making the Mauler Elites a formidable opponent. And the Mauler Elites were actually seen in General Ram's squad. So it does seem that the Mauler Elites were higher ranking locust soldiers compared to the standard Maulers and other boomers for that matter. Moving away from the Maulers, we also have the Butchers. Now the Butchers were Locust Boomers who served as chefs in the Locust Horde. You heard that right, chefs. So, the Butcher appears to be the lowest rank of all the Boomers in the Horde, as they aren't actually assigned to kill anything. All they do is chop up rockworms brought in by Locust hunting parties. They actually wore a large apron over the standard Boomer armor, with meat hooks attached, and they wore a flat helmet. And a bit about the rockworms themselves, so the rockworm was a creature that lived in the hollow on Sera. Described by Anya as an indigenous cave creature, these large worm-like organisms slither from one tunnel to another, eating the globe fruit that grow on the cavern walls and ceiling of the hollow. They are assumed harmless, but if you get in front of one of their mouths, they will bite, causing light damage. But a boomer and a butcher are basically the same creature. Although the butcher has less armor and a large meat cleaver, used for cutting up rockworm meat to feed the locust soldiers. The rockworm meat is taken from locust hunting parties, generally consisting of one to two cantus with many locust. So the cantus priests would summon the rockworm, the locust would kill it, and the butcher would chop it up and serve it to the locust, and of course the soldiers would eat it. Also, when the butcher was encountered, they will tend to say, HUNGER. However, Butchers that had too much exposure to emulsion mutated into lambent gunkers. The arm that held their cleavers mutated, connecting the cleaver to the body, and their other arm mutated into a stump of molten emulsion that could be lobbed at enemies from afar. Lambent gunkers were actually a lot bigger than the butchers. They were around 10 feet tall on average and appeared on the surface of Sera after the sinking of Jacinto City. These guys were basically locust butchers turned lambent, but we have actually never seen any of the Boom and Lambent variations, which is, I think, in my opinion, strange in a way, but it is also room for exploration for the Coalition if they wish to expand on the Locust and the Lambent. For me, it would be cool to see Lambent variations of the Mauler, the standard Boomer itself, and so on. Next up, we have the Flame Boomer. So the Flame Boomer was a Boomer variant recently fielded by the Locust Horde. They are equipped with a Scorcher Flamethrower, fueled by a set of emulsion-filled canisters on their back, similar to their Flame Grenadier counterparts. They wear slightly more armor than standard Boomers, including a heat-resistant helmet that fully covers their face and their head, but despite their helmets, they are susceptible to headshots like most Boomers. But unlike other Boomers, the Flame Boomers will try to flank you, which suggests that they could be slightly more intelligent. Also, due to their lighter weapons, the Flame Boomer can move considerably faster than other Boomers, matched only by the Mauler. But yeah, if one of the Boomers are about to burn you with a Scorcher, he will actually laugh. But a quicker and easier way to kill the Flame Boomers is to simply shoot the canisters on their backs, which causes the tanks to rupture and blow the Flame Boomers to bits. We also have the Grinder, so the Grinder, aka the Buckethead, was a Boomer variant recently fielded by the Locust Horde. They are equipped with a Mulcher machine gun, which they can use to lay down thunderous suppressive fire on enemy troops. They wear standard armor, with the exception that their chest plate has a high collar to protect their neck from both enemy fire and possibly from being hit and burnt by the shells expelled from their own gun. But to protect their heads, they sport a high flat-topped cylindrical helmet with the locust symbol shining in the center. Their helmets make them less vulnerable to headshots than other boomers except for the mauler. And when the grinders are about to fire their mulcher, they say Mine. And at times they are seen pairing up with maulers, which is a really really deadly combination. 
of both fire and cover, but the grinders do seem to be vulnerable to the Scorcher Flamethrower. We also have another boomer variation which is called the Tremor. So the Tremor was a boomer variant which participated in the Locust attack on Ilima City. Tremors had the unique ability to summon cedars by using their massive hammers to nail a special Tremor spike into the ground that the cedar can home onto. And the cedars were large eight-legged beasts that fired Nemesis spores out of a second mouth on their rear end. When the Locust Horde deployed Cedars onto the battlefield, they tended to use these creatures as artillery and anti-air weapon emplacements. They have also been known to jam radio transmissions with their very presence. Tremors wear similar armour to the Butcher class of Boomer. They have the same type of helmet and chest plate, but without the apron of course. And on their belt is a sheath that holds the homing spikes for the Cedars. Tremors battle cry would be Pound! and they were not seen often during the Locust War, they were seen in Gears of War 3's DLC, Ram Shadow. Now the Tremors had a signature weapon, and this was the Thumper, and this was a large metal rod, which also had the Locust symbol inscribed into it as well. An additional point is that the Mauler Elites and the Tremors were part of Ram's squad during the evacuation of Elima, so they were higher ranking Locust soldiers compared to the other Boomer variations. And now we move on to the savage variants of the boomers. So the savage locust, they were former members of the locust horde who survived the flooding of the hollow and they reverted into a feral state without the guidance of their queen. When Jacinto city was sunk underground by the coalition of ordered governments, the entire inner hollow was flooded, killing a majority of the locust horde by drowning before they could evacuate the hollow. Those on the surface, they survived and splintered into two factions. So there was the Locust without Queen Mira's guidance. They reverted to a tribal and nomadic way of life, which were the Savage Locust. While the Locust guarding Queen Mira, they maintained guidance and direction, and they became the Queen's guard. Despite being less organized and without a hive mentality, the Savage Locust were just as dangerous as the Locust Horde or Queen's guard, as they maintained hostility towards all humans. So one of the members of the Savage Locust were the Savage Boomers. So the Savage Boomers were Boomer variants that appeared around 17 years after Emergence Day. They were armed with a Digger Launcher and they have different armour to the traditional Boomer. They have a large pointed helmet that only shows their mouth area. A large collar like the Grinder, a large breastplate and they have a belt stretching from shoulder to hip with extra digger projectiles. These boomers have reverted to a tribal mindset, just like the other savage locust. Now, some of these savage boomers were armed with the digger launcher, and some were armed with the butcher cleaver. Some would be armed with the boomshot grenade launcher as well. Now, it is unknown if the savage boomers used the butcher cleaver, like the traditional butchers, to chop up food, but in the deadlands, there would have been no rockworms, so perhaps they chopped up animals and humans instead, but that's just a theory. The Savage Boomer's main weapon though, was the Digger. And the Digger Launcher was a unique single shot grenade launcher that was used by the Boomers of the Savage Locust Remnants. It fired a small creature, which was called, of course, the Digger, with explosives attached. Now the Diggers, they were small burrowing creatures, and when fired, they burrow under the ground behind cover, and then they pop up and explode in the air, killing the enemies in that cover. They can burrow through dirt, rock and wood, and when fired into a target, the Digger will latch onto the target and chew into its chest before exploding inside the victim. And if you actually listen closely as the Digger is heading for you, you can actually hear it say nom 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 nom. <laughs> So the Grenadiers were Locust Shock Troopers, often seen wielding a Nasher shotgun and bolt-up pistol, or throwing bolo grenades. Grenadiers should always be remembered for their weapons and their fighting style. They always use their Nasher shotgun in standard combat and should never be allowed to get in close. Their other go-to weapon that they use are their bolo frag grenades, and at times are also seen with the Boltok or the Lancer assault rifle and they had a better, more improved physique over the Locust drones, so they were the ultimate assault troops for the Locust, and the Grenadiers were known to be extremely aggressive. Their homeland was the Hollow, just like the other Locust, and they had grey skin with black scales. Their skin is practically rock hard in terms of durability, severely limiting the usage of cutting and slashing weapons against them. 
This was discovered on or soon after E-Day when the Sirens found that they were unable to defend themselves with their bayonets and combat knives and so the chainsaw bayonets made an excellent addition to the Lancer for the cog to pierce through locusts like the Grenadiers who like to get up close and personal. So these are the base Grenadier variants and then we also have many different Grenadier subclasses which I'll be breaking down as well. So first up we've got the Grenadier Elise. So these were the higher rank of the standard Grenadier and they can take and deal a lot more damage. Like the Grenadier, they are always equipped with a Nasher shotgun, Bolo grenades and a Baltoc pistol. They wear studded shoulder armour and a chest strap and they appear to be much more seasoned combat operatives as evidenced by their constant flanking attempts on higher difficulties. Their barbaric armour suggests that they are rather brutal fighters and up close they prefer to go for a one shot kill with an Asher shotgun. Grenadier elites are very very skilled with the bowl or grenades, so just because you're in cover doesn't necessarily mean that you're safe. And in battle they act almost leader like and rush in to kill any cog gear with their shotgun and then they run off to the next foe. Grenadier elites are therefore considered quite deadly and they should not be underestimated. So in essence they are the locusts elite assault troops and they were seen throughout the Locust War just like the standard Grenadier variants. And then we also have the Flame Grenadiers. So the Flame Grenadier was a Locust Grenadier armed exclusively with the Scorcher Flamethrower. And like all Grenadier classes, they specialised in close quarters combat. They were first encountered during the destruction of Halvor Bay, though only as prototypes to test their capabilities. And later on the coalition encountered more armoured grenadiers during the evacuation of Alima and later Operation Hollow Storm. Flame grenadiers are also equipped with a backpack fuel tank that significantly increases the fuel capacity of the Scorcher. They are equipped with the same armour that the Locust Grenadier elites have on but the Flame grenadiers also have a heat resistant helmet and a back mounted fuel pack. But similarly to the Flame Boomers and the Flame Drones the flame grenadiers can be blown to bits if you set off their fuel tanks by shooting at it. And the flame grenadiers, just like the grenadier elites and the standard grenadiers were seen throughout the locust war. And then we have the locust ravagers. So the locust ravager was the highest ranking subclass of grenadier. They were made up of the most brutally strong and tremendously resilient grenadiers in the locust hordes army. The Ravagers were charged with being the initial storming force when breaching, clearing and laying waste to key fortified cog facilities and fortifications. The Ravagers are at the top of the Grenadier food chain, similar to how the Palace Guard are at the top of the Theron hierarchy, so they are the Locust Horde's apex assault troops. And they are also armed with the Nasher and Bolo grenades as well, and the Ravagers have the Locust runes for breach and kill branded into their arms, which is their motto. A side note is that in Gears of War 2, Marcus notes the appearance of markings on the bodies of Locust drones following the first encounter with the Cantus, but they were never shown nor elaborated on further. Now these brands are presumably the same markings Marcus was referring to. So to elaborate on the Locust runes, the Locust runes basically represent the writing of the Locust Horde. They consist of symbols which represent individual letters, however, the Locust pronounced these letters and symbols the same as Tyron. The Locust runes were based on a lexigram board found in the Mount Kadar laboratory where the Locust Horde was created in order for the scientists to communicate with the drones. So the picture you can see is a computerized version of the Locust language. So the Locust also had a computerized version of the Locust runes. These characters are cleaner and less calligraphic than the handwritten alphabet. Many of the symbols remain similar to the handwritten versions, although some letters differ greatly to the point of being unrecognisable when compared to the handwritten counterpart. So that's a bit about Locust runes there. And then the Locust Ravagers also have cylinders strapped to their waist, which are Locust breaching charges. And these were used when creating entry points in enemy facilities and fortifications. Now when it comes to the Locust Ravagers armour, it really differentiates from other Grenadier armour, the overall armour aesthetic was meant to give off a very Juggernaut-esque feel with some gladiatorial inspiration. And I just want to give a big shout out to Parasidian who worked at the coalition who helped bring this character to life and of course made it canon in the Gears of War universe. And then we also have the Locust Hunters. So the Locust Hunter was an elite class of drone that predated the Grenadier 
and was originally designed with the task of hunting down and killing certain humans such as military and civilian leaders early on in the Locust War. In essence, they were Locust assassins in all but name. The Locust Hunters, they were armed with a deadly torque bow on its right arm and they were equipped with light armour, designed to be easily spotted, the Hunter was developed to be the showcase for the deadly weapon. But the torque bow was eventually given to the Theron Guard and the Hunters were identifiable by their horned like signature Hunter helmets. The Locust Hunters were eventually deprived of their main design purpose so the Locust Hunter was stripped of its original armour and given a Nasher shotgun and several frag grenades, becoming the Locust Grenadier. It is said that it was not included in the final game because of conflicts with animations, so they weren't seen in any Gears of War campaigns, but they were seen in multiplayer and official Gears of War media. And we also had the Locust Hunter Elites. So the Locust Hunter Elites were more aggressive and deadly than the lower ranks of Hunters, Hunter Elites were masters in assassination, and they were of course considered a serious threat to the COG High Command. They also bear a strong resemblance to the Locust Grenadiers, but they are seen as more of a threat in battle. They wore one of the least amounts of armour in the entirety of the Locust Horde, due to their already toughened hides, acting as enough protection for these assassins. But like their lower brethren, Hunter Elites were originally given torque bows to locate and hunt down very important humans, such as military and civilian leaders. But they were eventually replaced by the Theron Guards early on in the Locust War, and they were given Nasher shotguns instead. Nevertheless, they themselves were replaced by the Grenadiers. And in appearance, the Hunter Elite are of course very very similar to the standard Grenadier. The only difference between the two is that the Hunter Elite is armoured with a shoulder plate, but the Grenadier is not. So yeah, these were the Locust's master assassins, which were known as the Locust Hunter Elites. And then we also have the savage variants of the Locust Grenadiers as well. Though the Savage Locust were former members of the Locust Horde who survived the flooding of the Hollow and they reverted into a feral state without the guidance of their queen. When the Jacinto city was sunk underground by the coalition of ordered governments, the entire inner Hollow was flooded, killing a majority of the Locust Horde by drowning before they could evacuate the Hollow. Those on the surface survived and splintered into two factions, the Locust without Queen Mira's guidance they reverted to a tribal and nomadic way of life, while the Locust guarding Queen Mira maintained guidance and direction, becoming the Queen's guard. Despite being less organised and without a hive mentality, the Savage Locust were just as dangerous as the Locust Horde or Queen's guard, as they maintained hostility towards all humans. So one of the members of the Savage Locust were of course the Savage Grenadiers, now, the Savage Grenadier was a Locust drone that appeared around 18 months after the sinking of Jacinto. They are drones that reverted to primal ways, they have become tribalistic and are much more aggressive and they use primitive weapons and they charge at their enemies like barbarians. With access to gunpowder becoming far more scarce, Savage Grenadiers opted to use incendiary grenades rather than bolo grenades due to its bountiful resource of flammable alcohol mix and ease in construction. Unlike the normal Grenadiers, the Savage Grenadiers have not limited themselves to the use of one weapon like the Nasher. They use a range of weapons, including the Hammer Burst Assault Rifle, the Lancer Assault Rifle and the Sword Off Shotgun. They would also wear an Aviator's Hat with goggles, giving them a more Savage look than the base Grenadier variants. And then we also have the Savage Grenadier Elite as well. So the Savage Grenadier Elite was a Savage Locust variant of the Grenadier Elite, who we previously talked about, and they are also drones that reverted to primal ways, they have become tribalistic and are much more aggressive and they use primitive weapons and they charge at their enemies like barbarians as well. They were the elite savage assault troops for the savage locust and like the savage grenadiers, savage grenadier elites have opted to use incendiary grenades due to the scarcity of black powder. However, their higher rank means that they are privileged in gaining access to the Savage Locust's valuable stash of bolo grenades. And unlike their loyalist brethren, Savage Grenadier elites actually wear more armour than the Savage Grenadiers. And then we also have the Savage Hunters. Now the Savage Hunter was an elite troop primarily used to track down the hiding gears and humans of Sera. Hunters are bred for one reason, and they do not relent. It doesn't matter that they are abandoned to the Deadlands, you still can't hide from them. 
Eventually, they will find you. They of course do live up to their name. So they are known for their habit of finding humans relentlessly and they are not to be messed with. Despite the disbandment of the hunters in favour of grenadiers earlier on in the Locust War, the Savage Locust, due to either desperation or lack of coherent command structure, led to the return of the Hunter Assassins. They are one of the most vicious and degenerate looking locusts out there. Even amongst the standards of the Savage Locusts, they sport large fangs and they resemble more like a snake than they do a locust. And in the Gears of War universe, there are also Lambent Grenadiers. So during Operation Hollow Storm, Delta Squad advanced through the Locust Capital Nexus and they saw many Grenadiers turning Lambent and they were attacking Nexus during the Locust Civil War, overpowering Locust forces. Lambent Grenadier corpses were found by Delta Squad, and later a squad approached Delta and one of them tried to attack them, but Augustus Cole disposed of it. So the Lambent Grenadier was a Locust Grenadier, which had endured a prolonged exposure to emulsion. It is unknown how long the Lambent existed, but they were discovered within the first two days of frost by the Sirens while fighting the Locust Horde in Nexus. And we can assume that many Lambent Grenadiers also fought against the Locust during the Lambent War as well. As Locust Grenadiers would become infected, they would begin to glow a yellow greenish signature Lambent colour and then they would eventually fully mutate into a Lambent Grenadier just like the Lambent Drones. And as Delta saw in Nexus, the Lambent were overpowering Locust forces so the Lambent Grenadiers do seem to be a lot tougher than the Locust Grenadiers. The Theron Guard was an organisation of the Locust Horde's military which represents the elite of the Locust Horde. They were head and shoulders above the lowly Locust drones in terms of equipment, intelligence and training. They are elite Locust troops assigned to commando style raids against high profile targets and high level defensive missions that require the sort of precision the Therons possess and can handle. Some members of the Theron also act as field officers, leading the lesser Locust troops into battle. As elites, the Therons are more powerful, intelligent, accurate with their weapons and better armoured than their contemporaries, and they are invariably better armed as well, making them a significantly greater threat than the lesser ranked Locust troops. They are 6 for 8 on average, they have grey skin and black scales, just like the drones, but the Therons are easily recognisable from other locusts on the battlefield. The Therons wear heavy body armour that covers more of the upper body than drone armour and a long leather like strip of material hanging from the back of the waist. This trails behind them as they move and gives the impression of a trench coat combined with armour. Many wear distinctive looking helmets as well, often heavily embellished. Theron armour is laced with bright red flecks, presumably to give them a more imposing appearance. Most Therons use the Torque Bow as their weapon of choice and is wielded exclusively by the Therons. It was specifically designed for them and its advanced design shows that it is far more dangerous and far more utilitarian than many Locust weapons. The Torque Bow fires an emulsion fueled explosive tipped armour piercing projectile that resembles a large arrow. Therons are experts with this weapon with their range, precision and accuracy. Because of this, they are a deadly threat capable of instantly killing an unprepared gear from a considerable distance. They also make use of the Lancer Assault Rifle, Hammer Burst Assault Rifle and Nasher Shotgun, as well as the Boltock Pistol. Unlike drones, Therons are smart enough to make use of dropped weapons, so if an allied locust dies in their presence, they may raid their corpses for weapons or ammo. As elites who have better intelligence with better military training, Therons make extensive use of cover and ambushes and are smart enough to know when a battle is turning against them. You can expect them to flee rather than die if they take too much damage, and for other locusts to aid the Theron if they become injured. They frequently send drones and grenadiers forward as cannon fodder and to force gears out into the open, so they can take them out with their torque bows. They also often feign retreat in order to lure enemies closer and into preset firing positions. Their battlefield IQ is just of the highest order, so you should never underestimate the Theron Guards. So we've spoken about the Theron Guards as a whole, but let's talk about the different Theron Guard ranks and variations, because of course there were different subclasses within the Theron organisation. So first up we have the Theron Sentinels. Their role in the Locust Army was that of battlefield commanders, leading Locust troops on the field, and they possessed all the other abilities that a regular Theron would. 
but a Theron Sentinel also led small teams of Theron Guards. So for instance, when a pack of Theron Guards were designated to a high profile commando style raid or another special operation, a Theron Sentinel would be the leader of the pack of Theron Guards. In terms of armour, the Theron Sentinel's armour is almost identical to the regular Theron Guards, except for their signature Theron Sentinel helmet. We also have the Theron Elites, who were also known as the Onyx Therons or the Black Therons. And the Theron Elites were a co-organisation of Lokes Theron that appeared shortly after Emergence Day. They were specifically trained and worked under the command of General Ram, serving as his chosen warriors and sometimes loyal lieutenants. The Theron Elite carried a deadly arsenal, which included torque bows, modified weapons like the Elite Sword of Shotgun, a Gorgon SMGs and even Krill Grenades. They could also manipulate the Krill to some extent like General Ram. They also wear slightly similar armour to General Ram, which shows their presence and ranking within the Lokes military. The Theron Elites were an absolute force to be reckoned with. We also had the Cleaver Therons. Now the Cleaver Therons were Therons armed with a Butcher Cleaver, and they charge into battle and attempt to cut gears to pieces without hesitation. They run right past cover and don't stop until they're on top of you swinging away with their heavy metal blades. The Cleaver Therons wear red bulky heavy armour, similar to that of the Theron Guard and Theron Sentinel. The only difference however, is that they do not wear the skirt tassels around their waist. They also carry around Butcher Cleavers as their main and only weapon, hence the name Cleaver Theron. There were also the Palace Guards, who were made up of the most decorated and accomplished drones in the Locust Horde's army and were charged with the defence of the royal palace in Nexus and the Queen. As you can see straight away, the palace guard's armour is a lot different to the traditional Therons. This is because they were the most decorated drones and they had the biggest responsibility a locust soldier could have to protect the Queen and her royal palace. So they wore royal armour and a distinctive royal Theron helmet. Now during Operation Hollow Storm, when Delta-1 were able to breach the defences of Nexus, the palace guards used their intelligence and years of military expertise, setting up ambushes in front of the palace gate and setting up other traps within the palace. But unfortunately, all the palace guards encountered were killed, but the palace guards all gave their lives in the name of their queen. I also want to quickly go over the military ranks of the Therons, from the bottom to the top. Now the Therons were ultimately locust drones. They're not their own species, just to clarify because some people get a bit confused when it comes to that. So when it comes to the Locust Drones, you have your standard Locust Drones, who are the foot soldiers of the Locust Horde. They are standard infantry and have different classes specialising in different forms of combat. Then we have the Locust Grenadiers, who are the Locust Shock Troopers, and are stronger and more aggressive than the Drones. Then you guessed it, we have the Theron Guards, who are the elite Locust Troops and are head and shoulders above the Drones. So these are the drone subclasses and hierarchy, but to look at the ranks within the Theron organisation, we firstly have the Theron Guards. Then a level above the standard Therons are the Theron Sentinels, who lead small teams of Therons. Then we have the Theron Elites, General Ram's loyal lieutenants. And then we finally have the Palace Guards, who are the most decorated and accomplished drones in the army. Now we don't really know where the Cleaver Therons would fit in here, but I'd assume they'd be of the lowest ranks of Therons. As to me, I find it strange as to why they'd be armed with a Butcher Cleaver and not exclusive weapons like the Torque Bow that the Therons do tend to possess. Now during the Locust War, when the Hollow and Nexus, the Locust's home, was flooded by the Coalition of Ordered Governments in Operation Hollow Storm, the Locust Horde began falling apart. After the flooding of the Hollow, the surviving Palace Guards became the bulk of the Queen's Guard which was a loyalist army under the direct command of Queen Mira. While many of their Theron brothers became part of the Savage Locust, they became known as the Savage Therons. They were previously just your regular Theron guards and are nearly identical to the original Theron guards except for the colour of their armour, which is nearly bleached white and garnished with red lights. They also use different weapons most of the time. For example, most Savage Therons use a Butcher Cleaver or Sword of Shotgun, rather than their iconic Torque Bow. Some of the Savage Therons ended up living in the Saren Deadlands and were forced to adapt to the Sandstorms with new tactics and armour. Like Savage Drones, 
They burst from the ground to ambush their enemy. They attack with a cleaver, wielding it like a sword. This is a tactic previously used by the cleaver Therons, from whom the savage Therons modelled their technique, but unlike their predecessors, they carry more weapons in case they lose their cleavers. Also, within the Savage Locust, they didn't have an organised hierarchical structure, so troops like the Savage Theron were on the same level and rank as the other standard infantry. This was of course not the case within the Locust Horde army, prior to the flooding of the Hollows, as the Theron Guards were field commanders and were the elite troops. Now the Theron Guards voices are sibilant and with a definitive whispering hiss, giving them a distinctly menacing appearance. Though it is more intimidating, the hissing and whispering can be a big giveaway to the opponent of your position. Now the Theron's voices are definitely a lot more deeper and menacing than the standard drones. We have never been told why this is as of creating this video, but I believe this could be due to the Theron's generally being more experienced, battle-hardened drones, therefore being older drones. It's never been confirmed, but a theory that I have could be that the older the drones become, their voices become a lot deeper and raspier. This makes more sense with the fact that the palace guards have an even deeper and raspier voice than the Therons. And the palace guards are the most decorated drones in the Locust army, therefore most likely being even older drones as they would have served for a long time. But yeah, let me know what you think of this little theory in the comment section down below. I think it's safe to say that's not a natural K formation. You were wondering where they come from, Carmine? So the Locust Cantus were one of the three primary races of the Locust Horde. They were taller and leaner than the Locust Drones and the Cantus were actually Locust Priests and they fulfilled a support capacity on the battlefield. They reinvigorated injured locust with their characteristic chanting, and they inspired and bolstered the locust troops. Now the word cantus itself comes from the Latin cantus, meaning having been sung, and references its deafening, debilitating and functional battle cry. They are 7 foot on average and they tend to wield the gorgon submachine gun, and the ink grenade, but at times they are also seen with the hammer burst assault rifle, although that is more uncommon. They are capable of manipulating animals, they are capable of reinvigorating locust, they are members of the Queen's Guard, and they are field commanders and religious officials. And there were many Cantus variations seen throughout the Locust War, so let's break down the different Cantus variations. So firstly we had the standard Cantus, who were the locust priests, there were also the Savage Cantus, so the Savage Cantus were the feral counterpart to the Queen's loyal Cantus monks, and the Savage Cantus were formed after the flooding of the Hollow, and the Savage Cantus acted as the shaman to the Savage Locust until their apparent extinction upon the detonation of the Emotion Countermeasure Weapon, which ended the Locust War. Now the Savage Cantus came about because of the destruction of the Lambent Brumac under Jacinto Plateau, which secured victory for the coalition of ordered governments, flooding the ancestral home of the Locust Horde, killing millions and forcing survivors to flee to the Siren overworld. So as a result of this, many Locusts were separated from the Queen's remnant of the Horde, and these were known as the Savage Locust. So without the guidance of their Queen, the lost Locusts descended into primitive tribes, they themselves changing forever. So the Savage Locusts, they were very different from the original Locust. So out of all the Locusts that were separated from the Queen's remnant of the Horde, the Cantus Priests actually changed the most. They were hit the hardest. So they reverted to primal shamanistic ways and their healing screams descended into a dark tone. According to records, few sounds can replicate the terror from the screams of a savage Cantus. We also had the Locust Zealot, so the Zealot was a ferocious Locust Cantus unleashed upon the coalition of ordered governments, but this was during the early years of the Locust War. Now the Locust Zealot came about because the lead scientist of the Locust Horde, Ukon, harnessed the power of emotion to build his army, and the resulting experiments with the Locust Cantuses led to the creation of the deadly Zealot. So these enhanced Cantuses formed the fierce and unrelenting front line of Ukon's army, 
and each zealot wore an injection harness that delivered a continual flow of emotion into their bodies. This amplified the power of their attacks and granted them increased resilience and strength. And just like the standard Cantus, these Cantuses heal and buff surrounding locusts with the added durability enhancements, but they also have a toxic explosion upon death. And they also had the Zealot Helmet, which was different to the standard issue Cantus Helmet. We also had the Deviant Cantus. So the Deviant Cantus was a regular Cantus, but was another Cantus that was experimented on by the Locust geneticist Ukon, who was continuing his experimentation by harnessing the power of emotion. So like I said, he found that controlled injections of emotion into his foot soldiers resulted in highly powerful units like the Zealots. But of course, as Ukon was experimenting with emulsion, not every experiment had perfect results. So these were the Deviant Cantus, and they were more powerful and savage, but they were a lot less obedient. So although they were more powerful and savage, they were likely very difficult to control. Another Cantus variation was the Locust Armoured Cantus. Now the Armoured Cantus were an elite armoured class of Cantus Priest, they were first seen roughly 18 months after the sinking of Jacinto and they were covered in onyx armour and dual wielding Gorgon SMGs. So the Armoured Cantus they were a force to be reckoned with. The Armoured Cantus wore black coloured razor sharp spiked armour and this armour made them highly resistant to bullet based weaponry and allowed them to do offensive based roles which could slice and tear a downed enemy apart. This serves as an execution and like normal Cantus Armoured Cantus could heal nearby Locust as well. Now while their armour made them powerful opponents, the Armoured Cantus were not invincible. The armour could only withstand so many bullets and only offered mild protection against explosive based weaponry. And the Armoured Cantus had the healing abilities of normal Cantus, which just like the regular Cantus, left them vulnerable during healing. Also just like the Savage Cantus, the Armoured Cantus were seen after the flooding of Jacinto, but the Armoured Cantus were affiliated with the Queen, whereas the Savage Cantus were not affiliated with the Queen. And the regular Cantus only use a single Gorgon SMG, whereas the Armoured Cantus actually attack with dual wielded Gorgon SMGs, which is actually pretty deadly. And they can also roll into a ball dealing damage to enemies in their path, which is pretty crazy. And although the Armoured Cantus were not invincible, they had extreme durability and so they had the surprising ability to withstand a small to medium sized blast from a focused Hammer of Dawn Strike. Although they will still be injured slightly and knocked down similar to when they are hit by other explosive weaponry, this proved that the Armoured Cantus were a force to be reckoned with and are much more difficult to kill compared to the regular Locust Cantus. Now we've spoken about the Cantus and the Cantus variations, but there were also notable Cantus in the Locust Army. Notable Cantus as in high ranking Cantus in the Locust Army. So first up we have Scourge, and Scourge was the High Priest of the Cantus. His personal equipment consisted of ink grenades, a gorgon burst pistol, and his personal chainsaw staff, which had chainsaws on each end. Like his Cantus monks, he used his vocal cords to communicate with rockworms, and even the riftworm, which he led to destroy the cities of Tolan, Montevado, and Elima. He could summon tickers and could even perform incredibly high jumps, displaying great agility and he also had a personal Hydra as his mount. But Scourge was unfortunately killed when Delta Squad, who were riding Reavers, destroyed his Hydra, sending him falling a great height to his death. Now if you'd like to know the full story of Scourge, I have a video on my channel of the full story of Scourge, I definitely recommend watching that and I will leave that link in the description, so get the popcorn ready for that one, it's about a 30 minute video and I think you'll enjoy it. So moving on, we also have Keats of Roll. Now, Keats of Roll was the High Priest of the Trinity of Worms and member of the Locust Council. He served as High Priest during the Lambent War and the Early Locust War. Vrol was Queen Mira's advisor on all religious matters relating to the Trinity of Worms and in essence he was essentially the High Priest before Scourge and during the Lambent War he seemed to be quite an old Cantus in age. We also have Keita Droke who was mentioned in the Rise of Ram comics but we don't actually know how he looks. Now Keita Droke, or Droke the First, as Keita Vrol said, 
was the original High Priest of the Cantus and member of the Locust Council. He served as High Priest during the Lambent War and Droke was Queen Mira's advisor in all religious matters relating to the Trinity of Worms and he was the first to use emulsion fumes to connect one to a spiritual plane known as the Rift in order to create prophecies, gain knowledge and contact the gods that were known as Rift Worms. Now Keita Droke was the first Locust to assume the role as Keita so High Priest of the Trinity of the Worms, which was the holy religion of the Locust Horde. And his work was written into detail for future High Priests like Keita Vrol and Keita Scourge to study and practice. Now Keita Droke eventually died and was succeeded by Keita Vrol, and we don't know how Keita Droke actually died and when he died, but he was succeeded by Keita Vrol, and Keita Vrol was succeeded by Keita Scourge, if that makes sense. <laughs> And then finally we have the Scarred Cantus. Now this Cantus was only seen in the Gears of War comics as well. And the Scarred Cantus was a very cunning and strategic Cantus monk who commanded Locust forces at Jelaine. Now this Scarred Cantus was known for his ambush attacks and was known to be quite a strategic Cantus monk. So this Scarred Cantus led the Locust forces during the second battle of Jelaine. And this Cantus was able to set up an ambush that nearly killed Marcus Phoenix. But during the battle he was eventually killed by Damon Baird and Alex Brand whilst trying to revive a downed drone. And Scarred Cantus actually gets his name because of the big scar over his right eye. And he actually had one orange eye and one white eye which was pretty interesting. So by 7 BE, so 7 years before Emergence Day, members of the Locust Horde and various creatures of the Hollow became infected with a parasitic disease which was known as Lambency and this was due to exposure from emulsion. The Lambent became aggressive and would infect or kill all uninfected life. So this turned into an epidemic in the Hollow and soon became a conflict which was known as the Lambent War. So during the war, Apostate Scourge spent his early years studying and professing the Trinity of Worms which was a polytheistic religion that worshipped three rift worms who were responsible for carving out the hollow and creating life in the hollow. Through the rift worms, they led to the creation of the sires, which then of course birthed the locust horde. Apostate Scourge also spent his years leading locust hunting parties to lure rockworms out with his chance, which allowed the locust to kill the rockworms for food. Now under the apprenticeship of Keats of Roll, who was the high priest of the Locust at the time, Apostate Scourge pushed the limits of what he could achieve within the church and he did this by inhaling emulsion fumes and this gave Apostate Scourge prophetic visions and one of these visions was that the Locust Horde would fall if they continued to fight the Lambent and if they were to remain in the Hollow and this was seen as a blasphemous vision believing that the Riftworms would never abandon the Horde and the Hollow was their holy right. So because of this, Apostate Scourge was excommunicated from the church and forced to join the Locust Army. So basically, Scourge inhaled the emulsion fumes and he was given these prophetic visions. These visions were of the Locust Horde falling because they were continuing to fight the Lambent and of course they cannot beat the Lambent and remain in the Hollow. But the Cantus, they thought, what is this guy on? This guy is crazy get him out of here so they excommunicated him from the church and they forced him to join the locust army they didn't want anything to do with scourge so then scourge continued to act as an apostate and prophet within the locust army itself and scourge also became a soldier to fight the lambent army so during the lambent war scourge joined the bloodied vanguard where he met vold ram who was the leader of the bloodied vanguard and due to their strength and ruthlessness Scourge and Voldram became friends and comrades in war. Also in 0 AE, the Lambent army attacked the Gorgon Front, which was a major fortress that defended Nexus. So while Voldram and the Bloody Vanguard fought off the millions of Lambent wretches and Lambent drudges, Scourge inhaled emulsion to reach the Rift in order to receive prophetic visions of the battle. So he wanted to know what was going to be the end result of this battle, so Scourge then determined that the Gorgon Front would fall regardless of victory or loss. So as a result of this, Ram realised that the entire fortress was filled with explosive canisters. So he retreated with the remaining survivors of the Bleed Vanguard and ordered Ferl Jamard to open fire on the oncoming Lambent, causing a chain reaction explosion 
which destroyed the Gorgon front and the Lambent army, which gave victory to the Locust. And that victory was because of Scourge, because he was able to inhale emulsion fumes and give those prophetic visions of the battle. And then of course Ram gave the orders from there. And following the battle, Scourge rallied the troops with the prophetic vision that the war will be won in victorious glory. However, Ram confided in Scourge about his plan to save the Locust Horde. Journeying outside the hollow to the surface, Ram showed Scourge a human city during a battle in the Pendulum Wars and believed that humanity was in a weakened state like them to be fighting each other. Ram admitted that the Lambent War had gone on for far too long and will not be successful if they were to stay in the hollow and therefore believed that they should emerge and conquer the surface to abandon the hollow to the Lambent. So Scourge was then enlisted into Ram's plan to give the Lambent a crushing victory to convince Queen Mira to evacuate to the surface. So by doing so, Ram went to convince and recruit Vold Khan to abandon his post in the expansion hollow to allow the Lambent to attack the Temple of the Trinity. Meanwhile, Apostate Scourge was directed to return to the temple and profess his vision of the temple being assaulted to Keats of Roll. But Scourge had failed to convince Keats of Roll to aid them, but then all of a sudden, a horde of Lambent proceeded to attack the temple with a wounded Voldkarn and a few drones managing to escape. Ram and a squadron of boomers arrived and proceeded to bombard and destroy the Lambent. So that was a plan by Scourge and Ram. So as predicted, Ketovol realised that Scourge was actually telling the truth and Ketovol was convinced to allow Scourge, Ram and Khan attend Queen Mira's council. So at the council, Ketovol spoke on behalf of the validity of apostate Scourge's visions and the tactical approach of Ram, that the Hollow will fall to the Lambent and the Locust must colonise the surface. So, Queen Mira then demoted Uzil Srak to Vold and Vold Ram to Uzil, and then later Apostate Scourge was met by Uzil Ram, who began preparations with Queen Mira to invade the surface. Ram's first strike would be the human city of Janamon, and he wanted Apostate Scourge to join him in battle. So Scourge then accompanied Ram's army into the city of Janamon, where they managed to overrun and occupy an army base and using the rift, Scourge delivered a grim prophecy to Uzo Ram that Ram would perish before the end of the war and Uzo Ram then appointed Scourge to his second in command and to become high general in the event of his death. Now even this became true because as we know Ram did die at the hands of Marcus and Dom during the light mass offensive. However, Volsrak attacked Uzo Ram out of vengeance but he was executed by Ram with the help from two Theron guards with top bows, killing Srak and Ram and Scourge were prepared following a vision by Scourge of Srak's treachery. So once again, Scourge's visions helped Ram once again and was of course a great asset to the Locust Horde. And then of course Scourge and Ram continued to slaughter the humans of Janamon as they both led the Locust to war on the surface of Sarah on Emergence Day. So Ketovrol was the high priest of the Cantus monks and member of the Locust Council. Ketovrol was the second known Keter after Keter Droke the first and Vrol served as high priest during the Lambent War. So Ketovrol was Queen Mira's advisor on all religious matters relating to the Trinity of Worms. And the Trinity of Worms is a polytheistic religion of the Locust Horde based on the Riftworms and their queen. Its adherents believe that the Riftworms are their gods or life givers as they not only created the tunnel network known as the Hollow, but also created life within the Hollow that led to the eventual creation of the Locust Horde. The Riftworms and their various aspects have been chronicled in the Cantus Skulls and the rulers of Nexus Plates. So firstly, I'm going to talk about the Lambent War, in which Keter Vrol first appeared in the Rise of Ram comics, and this was his first appearance in Gears of War media. So in the comics, Keter Vrol took Apostate Scourge as his apprentice, he had Scourge pushed to the limits of what he could achieve within the church. By inhaling emulsion fumes, Apostate Scourge was given prophetic visions, and one of these visions were that the Locust Horde would fall if they continued to fight the Lambent and remain in the Hollow. So then Ketovrol's apprentice, Scourge, was enlisted into Voldram's plan to give the Lambent a crushing victory to convince Queen Mira to evacuate to the surface. 
Scourge's visions gave him some direction to return to the Temple of the Trinity and professed his vision of the Temple being assaulted by the Lambent Tukit of Roll. Now due to Scourge's visions in the first place, he was excommunicated from the church but when he returned to the temple to profess his thoughts to Gita Roll, the Cantors didn't seem to like him and they didn't allow him to enter the temple of the Trinity. But Keith of Roll was pleased to see him and that it was a return Vrol had long foreseen. And of course the Cantus monks would not question Keith of Roll, the high priest. So Vrol showed Scourge the inner sanctum of the temple of the Trinity, which it seems like not many had the privilege of seeing. This room had pictures of the three riftworms and many books. These could be older Cantus scrolls and more locust tablets which were known as the rulers of Nexus plates and more of Keith of Roll's research. Keats of Roll just seems to give me that bookworm sort of vibe. Instead of being on the front lines or doing anything to do with Locust military, Keats of Roll would just seem to spend a lot of time in the Temple of the Trinity and the Inner Sanctum and just work on his research because he's got so much research there as you can see. So Vrol said to Scourge that he was forced to banish Scourge by the will of the Cantus and he brought dishonour to Scourge's name so consider this reparation for wounds inflicted. Keats of Roll mentioned the Rift which was a spiritual plane for those with the knowledge and access. They spoke about Keita Droke, the first experience of the rift, where they can reach the trinity. So this was known through Keita Droke's body of work and writings. So it looks like Keita Droke's body of work and writing was passed down to Keita Roll, and he expanded upon that research. So Scourge stated that while Keita Droke's and Vrol's research is fascinating, Scourge has foreseen the fall of the hollows, that Locust time is up and the Lambent will conquer. Vrol did not believe Scourge's visions at the time of his explanation to the High Priest, as Vrol believed that the hollows would never fall and that they are their birthright, given by the Trinity of Worms. Vrol stated that Scourge's claims were an insult to the Trinity and Scourge claimed that the reason he was cast out was because his Cantus brothers were actually afraid of his prophetic gift. But Scourge had failed to convince Keith of Roll to aid the bloodied vanguard. A horde of Lambent then proceeded to attack the Temple of the Trinity. So Keith of Roll, he was shocked to see this is actually happening. This is true. So he realized that Scourge was indeed telling the truth about the assault. And he seemed to be devastated that this happened that Uzel Srak, who was supposed to be the master of war, had not heeded a warning to the Locust. Vrol stated that a Locust Council meeting was needed for the Queen to understand these dire consequences and that the fate of their kind depends on it. So at the Locust Council, Keith of Vrol spoke on behalf of the validity of Scourge's visions and the tactical approach of Voldram, that the Hollow will, in fact, fall to the Lambent and the Locust must colonise the surface as the Trinity lies dormant, because as you know, the three Riftworms were dormant at the time, but in the Gears of War timeline, it is unknown as to when they actually went dormant, so we don't know that. Now, at some point during the Locust War, Keats of Roll actually died and was succeeded by his apprentice, who was of course Acolyte Scourge, but it is currently unknown as to when he died and when he was succeeded by Scourge, and then of course Scourge became the High Priest of the Locust Horde thereafter. Now, Keith of Roll, he was extremely devoted to his religion, the Trinity of Worms, and it was always at the forefront of his mind, even when taking decisions. During the Locust Council, Keith of Roll would often go back and forth with the Locust head scientist Ukon, as Roll had warned and scorned Ukon for having corrupted the Locust Corpser with machinery. Because as you know, the hollow creatures like the corpses, reavers, etc. were seen as sacred beings that shouldn't be tampered with as they were given life by the riftworms who created the hollow. Ukon stated that corrupted machinery was the future of the locust horde, that Vrol was stuck in a long dead era and that once he is gone, the locust would finally be freed from his antiquated beliefs. So Ukon appeared to be more agnostic or atheist he didn't seem to believe in the Trinity of Worms religion and he appeared to believe more in science so as you can tell Ukon and Vrol would have had conflicting views very often. Even when Voldram's assessment of the Lambent War was initially discussed at the Locust Council, Ukon said that every eventuality should be planned for but Keats of Vrol argued that the Hollows would never fall, that they are a birthright created by the Trinity and evolved into the incubator of the Sires. Also, Keats of Roll seemed to be even more devoted to his religion than Scourge, as Scourge stated the words, Curse the Trinity, 
After talking to Vrol, so even though Scourge succeeded Vrol after Vrol died, Scourge didn't have the same devotion to the Trinity of Worms as Keita Vrol or perhaps even Keita Droke did. So the Rager was a specialised Locust breed that appeared during the Locust War and were known for their ability to metamorphose into monstrous forms. Due to their reckless abandon, large amounts of Rages died off early in the Locust War, becoming virtually extinct. The Rages acted as a reconnaissance unit for the Locust Horde when unraged, but would quickly turn into assault troops when enraged. The Rages were a subspecies of Locust Drone, so they were much different to the traditional Locust Drones, and they were extremely short-tempered, which you may be able to tell already. They would have thick grey skin with sharp claws and they looked slightly larger than Loke's drone in their unraged state. The Rages were known to use the breech shot straight pull bolt action rifle. Now this weapon was seen during the early days of the Locust War. It was built around the UIR's GZ-18 Mark sniper rifle, many of which were captured by the Locust Horde following Emergence Day, which was then heavily modified by the Locust with crude attachments and paint jobs creating the breach shot rifle. When in their more docile state, Rages can be beaten much like normal Locust troops. They can be gibbed with explosives, headshot with a precision weapon or executed with a chainsaw bayonet. The rather lethe and unassuming Rages were known to carry the breach shot rifle in their unraged state but they were far more dangerous when enraged. When angered, they would go into a state of metamorphosis due to emotion buildup inside them. The emotion buildup inside them led to several changes in the rage's body structure, entering a rage of metamorphosis. A rage's skin would shift to a bloody red colour, they would double in muscle mass, sprout blood red spikes and move with almost animalistic fury, essentially becoming a miniature berserker for a short amount of time. However, they cannot withstand the same amount of fire that the Berserker can, but the Rages in their enraged state can cause havoc very very quickly and decimate many COG troops without much difficulty, so they are not to be underestimated. They are also a lot more durable in this form, so once enraged, heavy weapons and headshots are devised to deal with them, and in their mutated state, Rages can only be chainsawed and retrocharged from behind. Fortunately for the gears fighting them, they cannot stay in their enraged state for prolonged periods of time. Because of this, such moments pass by quickly and the Rager is returned back to its normal form after a short amount of time. Ragers also had restraints around their ankles and arms, so perhaps the Locust Horde had to restrain the Ragers on many occasions, as they understood their very short-tempered habits and violent tendencies of the Ragers. Otherwise, the Ragers may just attack their own kind, for all we know. The Rages would rush into battle unlike the traditional Locust drones, so due to the Rages' reckless abandon, large amounts of Rages died off early in the war, becoming virtually extinct. And this was given as an explanation of why they appear as a new enemy in Gears of War Judgment, while not appearing in games that came later chronologically, as they were not seen in Gears of War 1, 2 or 3, but a number of Rages were encountered during Baird and his squad's return to Halvor Bay in Gears of War 3 Aftermath, and Baird was very very surprised to see them, as they were believed to have been wiped out early in the Locust War. These Rages were allied with the Savage Locust, and became even more feral than they were at the Horde's command. After the former members of Kilo Squad left Halvor Bay, Rages had apparently become extinct after the Emotion Countermeasure weapon was deployed, though it is unknown if any mutated to become part of the Swarm and it is also currently unknown if there were any other subspecies of Locust Drone other than the Locust Rages. There's a courtyard at the other end of your building, that's your best bet. Copy that. Well, we sure as shit can't stay here. You're paired. Yeah, that's right, asshole. Question is, who are you? <laughs> oh shit, quiet. Don't move. What was that? A berserker. She can hear us. She can smell us. Get out of here! We gotta get fucking out of here, man! Oh, 
Berserker in the vicinity. Please advise. Hold your fire, Delta. Standard weapons won't work. Do you still have the Hammer of Dawn? Affirmative control. You've only got minutes of satellite coverage. Get her outside and use the hammer. That's the only thing that'll work. We'll go. Delta out. All right, guys, sit tight. We came here to help you, and that's what we're gonna do. Dom, let's go. So Berserkers are female locust drones. They are blind, but powerful. Berserkers were known for their highly developed sense of hearing and smell, which compensated for their blindness. They had extremely durable bodies due to their bullet resistant armor and they were known for their near constant state of extremely aggressive behavior. Even though berserkers are blind, they use their sense of smell and hearing to find their targets. But berserkers can be killed once their extremely tough skin is heated or set ablaze which softens it and allows significantly more damage to be done and they're also fast enough to catch a speeding train as one Berserker caught up to the Tyro Pillar, which Delta Squad was on, and the Berserker actually jumped on as well. So Berserkers are roughly 10 foot tall on average, and they have bullet resistant armor. So those are the regular Locust Berserkers, and they are of course a force to be reckoned with. Now Berserkers are seen throughout the Locust War, but Berserkers were never encountered during the Lambent Pandemic, which was 17 years after Emergence Day, apart from the Lambent Berserker, which we'll break down in a minute. Now it is possible that the flooding of the hollows killed most of the berserkers and the remaining were kept hidden. And at the end of the locust war when the emotion countermeasure weapon was activated, if any regular berserkers did survive the emotion countermeasure weapon, it is unknown what they became when the locust became the swarm. Now it was speculated by Colonel Victor Hoffman that drones reproduced through rape, which is really dark and just shows how brutal the locusts were really. And the female drones, who were of course the berserkers, they were constantly in a fit of rage and would accidentally kill any locust drone that would try to mate with them. However, this would be an evolutionary disadvantage as every species needs to reproduce to survive. So locust drones were able to breed with berserkers and it seemed like the high ranking locust would have breeding rights over the other locust similar to how in nature you know the more dominant males have breeding rights but another process to create more drones was to capture humans from the surface and use Niall Sampson's genetic research to genetically mutate them into locust drones so we've spoken about the regular berserkers but let's talk about the lambent berserkers who are berserkers that had become hosts to lambency so Lambent Berserkers, who were also referred to as Lambent Zerkers, were the outcome of Berserkers that turned Lambent, and they appeared around 18 months after the sinking of Jacinto, so only towards the end of the Locust War. So Lambent Berserkers are larger and more deadlier than the regular Berserkers, so they are an absolute force to be reckoned with, right? They boasted superior strength and agility, and they were also capable of jumping in the air to launch a powerful ground blow. And the regular berserkers weren't actually able to jump, so the Lambent Berserkers had an advantage there. And the Lambent Berserkers also had four blade-like tentacles flailing around their backs. And just like the regular berserkers, a Lambent Berserker had excellent smell and hearing as well. But their eyesight was still just as bad. And Lambent Berserkers were actually a lot more durable than the regular berserkers, as a Lambent Berserker was able to withstand a Hammer of Dawn strike, whereas a regular berserker would become extremely damaged by a Hammer of Dawn strike. So the only real way to kill a Lambent Berserker was to attack its exposed chest cavity, which was protected by its ribcage. So in order to expose this cavity, the most common way was when the berserker prompted an attack whether it be charging or leaping in the air. The other way was to use incendiary weapons on the Berserker. It would not flinch the Lambent Berserker, but their rib cage would automatically open, exposing their chest cavity. And after a lot of damage, the Lambent Berserkers also begin to leak emulsion as well, and they leave behind walls of emulsion vapors wherever it went. And when the Lambent Berserker does die, it begins to self-destruct, flailing wildly or violently exploding. So you really need to get out of harm's way when it explodes. As we know the Lambent explode when they die. So when a Lambent Berserker explodes you need to get out of there. And the Lambent Berserkers are also slightly taller than the regular Berserkers. Coming in at 10 foot 10 inches tall on average. Which is close to 11 foot. And then we have the Matriarch or subject UL1192. Which was the first locust drone created at the Mount Kadar laboratory. And the Matriarch was actually the original Berserker. 
the female species of the locust horde. The matriarch was created by Dr. Niall Sampson and his team of scientists by combining the embryonic stem cells of Mira, a human with a natural immunity to emulsion, and sire DNA in order to create a new race of human hybrids that would be immune to emulsion and be used as a strong military force. So the matriarch was the mother of the locust horde and reproduced the first generation of drones. The matriarch had an innate ability to integrate her mind into the hive mind and allowed Mira to completely control over the locust. She was what connected Mira's daughter, Reina Diaz, and her granddaughter, Kate Diaz, to the swarm. And only one has been known to exist, so it is very rare compared to the regular berserkers. And just a bit about the hive mind itself. So the hive mind was a psychomagnetic link held by all members of the locust horde and the swarm as a collective consciousness. The hive mind was used to command and communicate with the locust, making them the perfect soldiers. It was unintentionally created by Dr. Niall Sampson through Mirror, whose embryonic stem cells were used in the creation of the locust horde, creating a plane of existence where the consciousness of the locust were connected. Now only females related to Mira were able to control the hive mind, such as the matriarch, the original berserker which was created from Mira herself, which amplified her connection and power. The link is located within the temporal lobe and is hereditary as it was passed down to Mira's human daughter, Reina Torres, who also passed it down to her daughter, Kate Diaz. Now the hive mind is also capable of preserving and transferring consciousness making one practically immortal. However, when the hive physically lacks a queen, they remain unguided until they seek a vessel for their queen, preferably related to mirror, because of that connection. Now the matriarch is a powerful heavily armoured enemy, and just like the regular berserkers, she is blind and relies on a sense of smell and hearing to locate her prey, which she usually attempts to kill by bludgeoning with her fists. The matriarch has other weapons at its disposal though, other than its overwhelming brute strength, which the regular berserkers rely on. So its scream is loud enough that it can temporarily incapacitate anyone within its range, and it can attack at range by flinging the spikes on its back. Now these spikes are explosive, and if not removed quickly, will detonate and kill anyone that they impale. Now the matriarch's weakness is slightly similar to the lambent berserker's weakness. Now the Lambent Berserker's weakness was a chest cavity that would become exposed, but the Matriarch's weakness was a large glowing blister on its back. Now this wasn't protected at all, but this can be difficult to shoot since the Matriarch will quickly turn its attention towards anyone who lands a hit. So the Berserkers are very very interesting enemies in the Gears of War universe. So the locust tickers were creatures that were found in the hollow on Sarah. So the tickers were creatures that were found in the hollow on Sarah that the locust used as a mobile land mine by strapping emulsion tanks onto them. And the hollow was an underground tunnel network beneath the surface of Sarah that was home to indigenous subterranean creatures as well as the locust horde. Located in the crust of Sarah, the hollow is separated between the inner hollow and the outer hollow so hollow creatures like the corpses, the krill, and of course in today's video, the tickers, all lived in the hollow on Sarah. So the tickers, they were named after the ticking sound they make while scurrying across the battlefield. They are small creatures that somewhat resemble a cross between a rodent and a reptile. They're only 2 foot in length on average, so they are pretty small but they are deadly. Tickers are always seen in large numbers and are used mainly as mines against cog vehicles. So the locust's primary use of tickers was to essentially use them as suicide bombers. However, the locust used them against cog ground troops as well, an example of this being the Cantus, which summoned two tickers at a time and used them as a last defense when under direct threat by cog units. Tickers are quick moving and relatively difficult to detect despite the sounds they emit, making them dangerous and unpredictable adversaries, especially in large groups. 
and due to the gas released by tickers when about to explode and the tanks mounted on their backs, it would of course be due to the emulsion that is used to cause the explosions. Tickers also have claws and they are capable of eating weapons and ammunition as well. Tickers also appear to have no eyes and this could be because they live in dark caves. In the real world, cave creatures have also evolved like this and this would explain the ticking noise they make, which is similar to how bats see in the dark by detecting objects using sound. Alternatively, it could just be their teeth clicking away given their jittery behaviour. Now we also have the wild tickers, but these are essentially normal tickers that haven't been recruited into the locust military and strapped with an emulsion tank. The main weapon of the wild tickers would be its claws, but they are considerably weak. I guess you could say these are tickers that haven't been tamed, and the wild tickers would be the tickers true form of how they were in the hollow, just really small grey skinned reptile like creatures that lived in the hollow and probably scavenged around for food. The Savage Locust also had a ticker assembly line where they would attach tickers to a moving rail and strapping them with emulsion tanks. Many tickers were also seen in cages so the locusts didn't exactly treat the tickers well so I kinda feel bad for the little guys in a way because they were just living their life in the hollow doing their thing and locust just took them and recruited them into their military so I kind of feel bad for them in a way and there was also a cutscene where there was a group of savage locusts that were watching a ticker pit fight so I guess tickers were also used for entertainment purposes for the locust horde as well Referred to as a monkey dog by Benjamin Carmine, the wretch was a hollow creature that the Locust Horde used as cannon fodder. They were small wiry hunched creatures that excelled in swarm and ambush tactics. On their own, a wretch could easily overpower an average human, but they stood little chance one on one against a gear, armed or unarmed. So the wretch's homeland was the hollow on Sarah, so the wretch's role within the Locust Horde was to act as cannon fodder for their army emerging from emergence holes in vast numbers to attack the local population of every city the locust attacked, feasting on any human they could prey upon. Wretches were relatively intelligent and able to manipulate unsuspecting soldiers and civilians into traps. They were extremely versatile in movement, able to crawl and cling to most surfaces. They were relatively weak to gunfire when compared with other locust creatures, but they made up for it with sheer numbers. Wretches were only 3 foot 1 in height so they weren't very large but they were always a nuisance to cog soldiers, weaponizing their claws, teeth and they had a deafening screech. Chainsawing a wretch with your handy lancer is always an easy option, but unfortunately it will leave you vulnerable to the other wretches since they like to hunt in packs. Your trusty Nasha shotgun is always a safe bet to get these guys out of their misery, or you can actually kill them relatively easily with 1-2 to melee hits. This also shows the brute strength of your average cog soldier, as the majority of cog gears are absolute freaks of nature, they're not like your average humans. Unfortunately, due to the parasitic fungus known as emulsion that existed on Sierra, some wretches had endured a prolonged exposure to emulsion, turning into lambent wretches, and these were the actual first lambent species known to the cog. Due to the emulsion, their body colour had also changed to black charred skin, infected with yellow emulsion bioluminescent boils. Lambert wretches are volatile and considerably tougher than a standard wretch in both attack and durability. And of course these wretches would have been associated with the Lambent and not the Locust. So these wretches would have attacked humans and Locust as well. Now the wretches are actually the first Locust we ever encounter in Gears of War. And the Lambent wretch is the first Lambent we ever encounter. So I thought that's a pretty cool fact to be honest. And during the development of the first Gears of War game, the Wretch had a previous design when the Locust were originally going to be named the Geist. So the Wretch Geist was of course scrapped for the Locust Wretch that we've known throughout the Gears of War series. So the locust corpses were one of the many natural denizens of the hollows on Sarah and the hollow was an underground tunnel network beneath the surface of Sarah 
that was home to indigenous subterranean creatures as well as the locust horde and the corpses as well as many of the hollow creatures were eventually tamed by the locust horde as tools for war and the corpses were enhanced by the locust head scientist Ukon. The corpses were used to dig tunnels all across Sera, allowing locust forces to move undetected and even behind cog lines. The Jacinto Plateau, which was positioned atop a solid granite plateau, was the only place on Sera that the locust could not use corpses to dig through. Even though corpses were more strategic than offensive, they were still considered very very dangerous and they were known to track and stage ambushes hinting at a relatively high level of intelligence or instinct and the corpses were around 36 feet tall on average and they were extremely durable and they had grey and white skin corpses were often seen moments before locust attacks and often symbolised the locusts emergence on E-Day and at some point during the 7th cycle of the Lambert War Vold Khan discovered a deformed corpser with a missing leg and decided to nurture it, and he called this the Shibboleth. Voldkan then requested that Ukon help mend and modify the Shibboleth. Ukon not only devised a metal leg for the Shibboleth, but he also modified it with armor plating, troikas, emulsion bombs, and designed it with the ability to expel nemesis and diggers, as well as to breathe fire as well. The shibboleth was unique in that it had claws very close to that of an infant corpse, one of which is a mechanical prosthetic, and with the ability to launch nemesis. Shibboleth was extremely unique in that it appeared to serve the locust, or at least Khan, on its own free will, rather than being broken and forced into servitude like some of the other animals. It is unknown if the shibboleth was unique, or if there were others of its kind, and we don't know if there were corpse mutations, like the Hydra which was the result of mutating Reavers, we don't know if there was the same thing for that but for the corpses. Although much of the corpse population was wiped out after Operation Hollow Storm in the Locust War, when the ancestral home of the Locust was sunk, a sizable number of corpses did manage to escape but they became wild. Some of them were found by the savage locust and kept in captivity to be bred and tamed for battle in the Deadlands. Delta Squad later confronted a number of these corpses as they made their way through Savage Locust territory. Unfortunately, Delta Squad accidentally stumbled into a corpse and nest, and a hatchling burst out of one of the eggs, but it was killed when it attempted to attack them. The death of its offspring enraged the mother corpse, who was absolutely huge, who let out a roar which caused the other eggs to hatch. Now Delta fought off the hatchlings, and the mother corpse appeared to face its offspring's killers. Presumably, corpses sexually reproduced like most creatures on Sera, by nature, meaning they lay eggs rather than give live birth. They normally hatch on their own time, but are capable of hatching on their mother's call, usually to defend the nest. When corpses are born, they're actually quite small and frail by adult standards, roughly coming up to the size of a large Seran dog in comparison. They were also quite pale and most likely blind at this stage of development. However, they probably possessed acute hearing or smell out of the shell, given Delta's battle with the corpse and nest in their journey across the Deadlands. Now, corpses were born with four fingers, if you want to call it that, and given the difference between a corpse hatchling, the Deadlands mother corpse, and the militarized adult corpse, corpses most likely grew more claws the older they got, up to a total of eight at adulthood. They also grew in size, strength, and durability as expected from most animals. Even at adolescence, corpses were remarkably sturdy, capable of taking a motorized chainsaw to the face and still living to fight another day. And after the activation of the emulsion countermeasure weapon in 17 years after Emergence Day, which ended the Locust War, all of the Locust and the Lambent were killed, so it is unknown if any corpses survived or whether or not they evolved into members of the swarm. So in Gears of War, the Bloodmount was a hollow creature that the Locust Horde rode atop. They are large, bulky creatures that remain low to the ground, and they have a unique physiology in that they use their large muscular arms as legs. So essentially, they're actually walking on their hands. Their true legs dangle beneath their bodies and end in razor-sharp talons, which they use as their primary form of attack. 
The blood mounts are usually accompanied by a rider and these are known as beast riders. So the beast riders were locust drones that rode on a blood mount, reaver or even the brumac. The beast rider was a dreaded enemy that inflicted heavy casualties on the gears. But the blood mounts can also be seen with other riders too at times, for instance their own guards or even locust grenadiers. So the blood mounts, similar to the corpses and the brumax, were from the hollow. But just like the other hollow creatures like the corpses and the brumax, the locust were able to control these creatures. Although the reason as to how they were controlled by the locust has never been fully explained as of creating this video, it could be due to the designed helmet technology that allowed the locust to control them. Without the helmets, the creatures become rogue and just as dangerous to the locust as they would be to their enemies. And it is likely that the locust lead scientist Ukon was responsible for this helmet technology and the ability for the locust horde to control these hollow creatures. A little bit of trivia which I thought was pretty cool is that in Gears 2's horde mode, if a blood mount takes enough damage or sometimes if its rider is killed, the blood mount will momentarily stop to remove its headgear. And this allows the player to finish off killing other enemies or finish off the blood mount itself. And when this happens, we actually get to see how a blood mount looks without the headgear. And I think that's pretty cool to see how it looks without the headgear. So I thought I'd include that there. I also want to talk about the blood mount stables. So these were where the blood mounts were kept. So the blood mount stables were the holding area for the blood mounts used by the locust beast riders. And the three Theron ranks have all been seen to ride these as well and presumably use these stables. These stables are only actually seen in Gears of War 2 because of the introduction of the blood mounts and it is quoted by Augustus Cole and seen by Delta Squad that human heads were fed to the blood mounts for sustenance. And this along with many other reasons would be as to why the locust took human prisoners. One reason of course being of the newfound use of blood mounts. Now during Operation Hollow Storm, Delta encounters the blood mount stables which were full of beheaded human corpses, which was the blood mounts food. The blood mounts inside tried to attack the gears through the bars, but they actually unable to harm Delta Squad. Now these stables were located at the bottom of the Locust Palace, near a lift that was the back way entrance. And the fact that humans were used as food for the blood mounts is absolutely crazy. And throughout Act 4, Chapter 2, you can see mangled bodies seen on operating tables. And it's just crazy, the locusts, they're absolutely brutal. They'd literally just chop off human heads and serve them to the blood mounts. Crazy stuff. And the blood mounts held in these pens seem particularly aggressive and will attempt to attack the player through the bars. And you can actually choose to kill the blood mounts in the stables or not, but it makes no difference to the actual game, as the blood mounts are unable to escape unless, of course, the cage is opened. Now it remains unknown if the blood mounts survived the emotion countermeasure weapon which was activated 17 years after emergence day. So if the blood mounts did survive, like other hollow creatures like the brumax, it remains unknown as to if they went through metamorphosis too. And if they did, it will be interesting to see how they look like now, over 25 years after the end of the locust war. Shit, there it is, now what? Now, we piss it off. Let's roast this thing. Run to the Transformers. Where? Over there. The access road. The fence is open. Run! Bad. So the Brumac was one of the largest species of hollow creature, believed by COG scientists to be the apex predator of the hollow. COG research indicated that they were bred from apes by the locust, which was actually correct as this was done by the locust geneticist Ukon to use the hollow creatures as tools for the locust horde to prosper and to use them as weapons of war. The Brumax would often grow to about 12 plus meters in height, which is about 40 feet tall and weigh around 10,000 kilograms. These huge monsters had extremely thick hides, even without their heavy armor, 
Unlike the Corpser, which was another hollow creature, the Brumax only had two eyes, but the helmets are covered in luminescent lenses, giving the illusion that they had more than two eyes, but they only had two. So the Locust geneticist Ukon created the armor for the Brumax and the other hollow creatures that the Locust Horde used, and he also designed the helmet technology that allowed the Locust to control these hollow creatures. Because without the helmets, the creatures become rogue and just as dangerous to the Locust as they would be to their enemies. Now the Brumax were equipped with wrist mounted chain guns and a back mounted rocket launcher, making them extremely deadly at both close and long range, and they possessed incredible strength capable of pushing over an assault derrick with a single shoulder shove. So these giant reptilian like creatures were enslaved by the locust and used in battle as massive sentient tanks and despite several sightings of locust riding on the backs of these beasts, no humans had ever attempted to ride one until Marcus Phoenix and Dominic Santiago during the last hours of the sinking of Jacinto City. So the role that the Brumac played in the locust army was a tactical one being deployed to act as a walking arsenal, laying waste to any and all human forces in its path. It used its weapons to devastate human military forces and level infrastructure. And when the Locust Horde invaded a city, the Brumac was used to cause heavy casualties and large amounts of destruction. And besides offensive purposes, Brumacs have been seen in and around the Locust Capital Nexus, being used for defensive purposes, in this case, protecting their city. So those were the original Brumax, and then we also had the Lambent Brumax. So the Lambent Brumax was the result of a Brumax coming into direct contact with emulsion or emulsion vapors and becoming heavily mutated. So its mutation and mutation results are vastly different from other Lambent lifeforms. The Lambent Brumax grew several stories tall, coming in between 98 to 140 feet tall, with its head splitting open, with a second one coming out of it, and with multiple huge tendrils coming out of its body. It was so heavily mutated that it did not appear remotely similar to a Brumac any longer. And of course, the Lambent Brumac being killed triggered a massive explosion on a huge scale, and the Lambent Brumac was substituted for the light mass bomb in order to sink Jacinto City and flood the hollow, which was the home of the Locust, with seawater. There's our ticket out of here! Get on those reavers! Marcus, I don't think they're gonna let us just climb on them. You got a better idea? Let's ride, Delta! Always wanted me a little horse. It's a fly one. It ain't cool, but let's just get the fuck out of here. Let's go. So the Reaver was a large flying creature utilized by the Locust Horde that also possessed the ability to walk on the ground. They could carry one pilot and one additional passenger and they were armed with a variety of weapons. They were used by the Locust to suppress the COG's air support and dominate the gears on the ground. So the Reaver's body structure and resulting function is complex, especially in the matters of how it is able to fly. The Reaver's raptor-like head is small in comparison to its large body, which is tough with several tentacles in the back which probably act as the Reaver's flying limbs. Reavers actually lived in the hollow, so they were one of the many indigenous subterranean creatures that lived in the hollow. So we've spoken about the other hollow creatures such as the Brumax, the Corpses, and we also have the Reavers as well. So Reavers were 10 feet tall in height and around 10 to 15 feet in length. They also had black and grey skin as well. There are also two small hook shaped limbs on the reaver's belly and their tentacles are powerful of which reavers can attack with as well. Their tentacles also have a gland that can secrete an oily mist to obscure visibility and maybe one of the ways the reaver could help ink the sky from Hammer of Dawn Strikes alongside the Nemesis. Now reavers may fly with lighter than air gas like gas barges which explains their violent explosion upon death. Reavers serve as flying vehicles for the Locust, deployed to launch quick bloody raids against the humans and reinforce faltering Locust attacks or defensive lines. Like I said the Reaver has two seats, one for the pilot and one for the gunner, the latter being either a standard drone or a more threatening Theron guard. Also Reavers do have little to no armour but they do have very very tough skin, making them difficult to kill but not impossible. They also have a small red bulge located on their underbelly 
and this spot is vulnerable and if a gear can manage to bypass the reaver's weaponry and tentacles they can kill it with relative ease and like many weapons in the gears of war universe the reaver has several affiliation lights on their saddle and helmet that will become blue or red in relation to the pilot's affiliation so whether it's cog or locust so as you can see in this early concept art the reaver's original name was actually the geist reaper because back during development of Gears of War 1, the Locusts were originally going to be called the Geist. So the Reaver's original name was actually the Geist Reaper, which sounds pretty badass to be fair, but the Locust is an amazing name. So those are the standard Reavers, but there was also the Locust Hydra, and the Hydra was a mutated species of the Reaver. The Hydra was the personal mount of the Locust High Priest Scourge, and the creation of the Locust Scientist Ukon. Ukon created the Hydra through actually mutating Reavers, because as we know, Ukon loved to experiment with different Locust troops to aid the Locust and help strengthen their army and the Hydras were around 50 to 54 feet, so they were huge and they were much more larger and deadlier than the standard Reavers. They acted as a personal mount and gunship, they could shoot missiles and rockets, they had a Troika machine gun attached and they had huge tentacles. So the Krill were highly aggressive carnivores, the krill were small, winged creatures, measuring around 2-3 to three inches in length. Their two eyes also glowed a pale yellow light. So the krill were native to the outer hollow on the planet Sera. Located in the crust of Sera, the hollow is separated between the inner hollow and the outer hollow. So the krill were known to live in the outer hollow, which was closer to the surface compared to the inner hollow, and the outer hollow was explored by humans after the invention of the light mass process, to refine emulsion for fuel. Due to their subterranean nature, krill were extremely photosensitive, with bright sources of light blinding them to the point of physical pain. In fact, krill were so sensitive to light, they even burst into flames whenever they were exposed to ultraviolet light. Krill were nocturnal and as such were most active at night. They slept in the safety of the hollow when the sun was out, but once twilight descended, they would begin to emerge from their subterranean warrens in search of food, which was generally anything that left the light, which in this case would have been other hollow creatures or probably whatever they could find really. Krill swarmed their prey, devouring it piece by piece, little by little, multiplied a hundredfold, utterly consuming the target until there was nothing left, not even bone. Not even the locust horde was completely safe from the Krill's voracious appetites, though they were often ignored when there was an abundance of humans to feed upon. However, the Locust have also been known to directly use the Krill, the most prominent example being General Ram, who somehow exerted a sort of control over the Krill, which hasn't been fully explored as to how Ram of all the Locust had a large amount of control over the Krill. The unidentified Theron elite that accompanied Ram during the evacuation of Alima could also manipulate the beasts, but to a lesser extent. The Locust used the Krill Grenade which was a weapon used by the Theron Elite and it is considered a more tactical but unsophisticated way of weaponizing Krill in contrast to Ram's symbiotic and mutualistic relationship. Due to this factor, Krill Grenades are only gifted to the most elite of Locust and only those under Ram's command, given the veracity of the Krill. It functioned similar to an ink grenade, but instead of toxic ink, it attracted a swarm of krill to rip apart any humans unfortunate enough to be caught in it. Now, it is unknown how the grenade actually attracts the krill, but it seems that since the evacuation of Lima took place during daylight, the grenade might obscure the area so that the krill can attack the victim. It could also be something in the ink that helps the krill detect its prey, such as a peculiar pheromone that attracts only krill to that particular vicinity. As such, despite similar outward appearances, it is possible that this species of immature nemesis are a special and separate breed. And nemesis were flying organic mortars used by the locust horde. They were released by a cedar's secondary mouth and would make a beeline for the nearest enemy unit. It was deadly against Cog Gear Squads or King Ravens, and Nemesis were used many times by the Locust Horde during the Locust War. One example was when General Ram used Nemesis during his assault on Elima City. Nemesis played a pivotal role during the assault, inking the skies above the city so that it could be cleared from its human population by a Krill Storm. And Krill Storms were when Krill congregated in large numbers, sometimes numbering in the millions. 
and they were considered incredibly dangerous by the coalition of ordered governments, enough to evacuate entire cities if one was seen over the horizon. And by 12 AE, so 12 years after Emergence Day, krill were becoming more and more common around Jacinto Plateau, which forced the locust to cut back on their night raids. This caused heavy speculation in the coalition about the origins of the krill, with Colonel Victor Hoffman guessing that they were an engineered experiment gone wrong, or something else that the COG did not know about. And at the Tyro Pillar at the end of Gears of War 1, Marcus Phoenix and Dominic Santiago faced off with General Rahm, who once again used the Krill as a shield to protect him from weapons fire, explosives used by the two, and a searchlight manned by the Coltrane from a nearby King Raven caused the Krill to flee Rahm for several moments, leaving him vulnerable to gunfire, though the Krill used these opportunities to attack directly. Eventually, Rahm was killed and the Krill fled without his control over them to keep them there. So with the death of General Rahm and the detonation of the light mass bomb, which destroyed the Outer Hollow, the Krill's breeding grounds were destroyed and their species became virtually extinct, allowing the coalition to retake the capital Ephira. As a result, Ephira and Stranded could once again roam free in their city without the fear of being eaten alive. It has been hinted that there may have been different species of Krill, but this has never come to light. No pun intended. And the Krill were originally planned to be in Gears of War 2. They were supposed to be in a chapter taking place in a cave filled with glowing maggots that they feed upon. But for unknown reasons, the chapter and any actual Krill appearances were left out. Instead, Epic Games placed a collectible explaining the effects the Lightmas Bomb had on the Krill breeding grounds, which led to their extinction. I want every outpost between here and Azura at full readiness. And make sure we don't lose him again. God damn it, she's still alive? How the hell did she survive the flood? So, she's still running the show. Oh shit! Look at the size of that book! Mm, I got your number, bitch. So the Tempest was a large flying locust creature and the personal mount of the locust queen mirror. Resembling a giant flying beetle clad in golden armor, it was the royal mount that was seen in Gears of War 3 where the Tempest stalked Delta 1 throughout their journey to reach Adam Phoenix in their attempt to end the Lambent invasion. It also had the ability to summon multiple locust shriekers. So the Tempest was a massive flying beetle-like creature from the hollows of Sarah. So before the time of the Locust Horde, the Tempest would have been assumed to be one of the major predators in the Hollow due to its mobility, durability, size and offensive abilities. The Tempest had four legs, four wings and a mouth that could shoot a powerful beam of intense light that literally lit everything that it hit on fire. So the Tempest when encountered was an absolute force to be reckoned with. When the Tempest came into the ownership of Queen Mira, the Tempest was suited up with a set of golden armor. This armor was so thick and well built that only the Hammer of Dawn could kill it, very much similar to a Berserker, which shows how durable the Tempest and its armor was as it needed multiple blasts from an orbital satellite based laser to take it down. Now it is unknown if the Tempest was the only one of its kind or if there were others like it, but if it was the only one of its kind, you could assume that the Locust used their geneticist work to create the Tempest. Now this is just speculation, but the reason why I'm saying this is because Ukon, the Locust geneticist, was the mastermind behind the Locust Hydra, which he created through mutating the Reavers, who were another form of hollow creature. And the Hydra was used as the personal mount for Scourge and Ukon himself. So the Tempest, being a mutated, genetically engineered royal mount for Mira, doesn't seem too far-fetched. Although that is my own speculation, it would be interesting to know more about the Tempest's origins. During the development of Gears of War 3, the Tempest was originally called the Locust Dreadnought, before it was renamed to Tempest. The Tempest also had the ability to summon Shriekers, 
and the Shriekers appear to be the Tempest's offspring due to their resemblance to the Tempest and the fact that the Tempest spawns them. So, what are the Shriekers? So a Shrieker was another type of hollow creature that appeared during the Locust Human War and the Lambent Invasion. As the name suggests, they make a very harsh shrieking noise. They were very small creatures with height of around 1 foot that floated in mid-air and had a reddish pink glow. The Locust Horde equipped the Shriekers with modified Gorgon SMGs which made them formidable foes. But in their homeland in the Hollow, before being taken into the Locust Army, you'd assume they wouldn't have been as harmful given that they would have lived without these Gorgon SMGs and the armor. Shriekers were bioluminescent and had the ability to float above the ground flawlessly. It's possible that they used methane to stay afloat, explaining their flammability, but despite their size, they were surprisingly formidable opponents with their swarm tactics, considerable agility and surprising accuracy. It is highly likely that the Shrieker is an infant juvenile Tempest, seeing as how it only appears being spawned from the back of the Tempest, which would in fact make sense given their biological similarities to the Tempest. See, that's what happens when you flood their tunnels. They rebuild anywhere they can. Yeah, I thought it was kind of weird to see them up here strolling around. They ain't the kind for a day at the beach. Seems like they dug themselves a new home. They must be excavating the whole area. Hey, that barge looks like it's setting down. Anyone up for a hijack? Yeah, first class to Anvil Gate? Let's do it. So the Savage Locust, they were former members of the Locust Horde who survived the flooding of the Hollow and they reverted into a feral state without the guidance of their queen. When the Jacinto city was sunk underground by the coalition of ordered governments at the end of Gears of War 2, the entire inner Hollow was flooded, killing a majority of the Locust Horde by drowning before they could evacuate the Hollow. So those on the surface, they survived and splintered into two factions. The Locust without Queen Mira's guidance reverted to a tribal and nomadic way of life while the Locust guarding Queen Mira maintained guidance and direction, becoming the Queen's guard. So despite being less organised and without a hive mentality, the Savage Locust were just as dangerous as the Locust Horde or Queen's guard as they maintained hostility towards all humans. So the leaderless Locust, known as the Savage Locust, they started becoming feral and they turned savage unlike their comrades in the Queen's Guard who remained loyal to Mira. So around 16 AE, so 16 years after Emergence Day, the Savage Locust built new tunnels close to the surface and they started living in the Deadlands on Sarah and in the former homes of the Sarans, trying to recapture some sense of their former homes. A large group of Savage Locust took over areas and turned them into strongholds, killing anyone who approached their territory, whether it was human or lambent. The Savage Locust would also make their way to any wreckages to scavenge supplies and kill any human survivors. Now one of the Savage Locust's most recognisable traits is their apparent rejection of the Queen symbol as they appeared to no longer have any attachment to her or her army. Now it remains unknown if the Savage Locust still believed in the Trinity of Worms religion and if they still kept the symbols, emblems, scrolls and artefacts that seemed valuable to their kind when they still lived inside the Hollow. But with the Savage Kansas's reverting to shamanistic ways, it seems very unlikely. The Savage Locust also seemed to mark any ticker assembly lines with paintings of said creatures, though it remains unknown if they used this same technique while they were underground. Now, although the Savage Locust no longer followed the Queen's command, it remains unknown whether there was conflict or not between them and the Queen's Guard. But this was probably not the case, as both groups have been seen cooperating with each other at times, like in the Battle of the Deadlands and the Battle of Anvil Gate. The Savage Locust appear to follow some of the original ways of the Locust, however there are many differences between the two factions. While the Locust Horde was organised and each class had a unique purpose on the battlefield, the Savage Locust appeared to follow no organisation and they use any weapons they can scavenge. So as I stated in my Locust Horde lore video, in the Queen's Guard of the Locust Horde, there were set military ranks and soldiers like the Theron Guards, they were highly regarded in the army. But in the Savage Locust, all of the troops seemed to be at the same baseline level 
with no hierarchical structure, but more sort of like a brotherhood, as both Savage Kansas and Therons seem to act as cannon fodder, something that only the drones and the boomers did in the Queen's army. And as stated before, it remains unknown if the Savage Kansas still reinforced the belief in the Trinity of Worms religion, although it is probable that after becoming shamans, they left their religion behind and became simple soldiers without any healing abilities. Now the Savage Locust, they did keep some of the Locust ways, but they did abandon several of the Locust ways as well, but they still kept a deep hatred for humanity, and they would kill any human being who dared enter their territory, and they would often use their charred corpses as a warning for any intruders. But it is possible, however, that the Savage Locust eventually returned to the Queen's army, or at least they made some sort of agreement with her, since they lost their main compound at the Deadlands to the Cog, and with Mira's return and her promise of a new world for the Locust, along with the fact that this time she had a weapon that could wipe out both the Lamban and the humans once and for all, could have inspired them to once again serve their queen on her quest against humanity. So this could explain why they aided the queen's forces during the Battle of Anvil Gate and the mission to Halvor Bay on their search for Delta Squad. So now that we've explained the Savage Locust as a whole faction, let's break down all of their troops. So, first up we have the Savage Drone. So the Savage Drones were the most common of their Savage Brethren. The Savage Drones carved a new existence on the surface of Sarah quite effectively. The Savage Drones were stranded after the flooding of their subterranean homeland, the Hollows. They were the most numerous members of their tribes and they made up the bulk of the Savage Locusts fighting force. Many took residence in the infamous Saren Deadlands alongside other Savage Locusts and like all Savage Locusts, the Savage Drone salvaged the MK1 Lancer Assault Rifle which was also known as the Retro Lancer, which had the bayonet, not the chainsaw, among other weapons to do battle against foes, but they did enjoy the raw power that the Retro Lancer offered. They also had to adapt to new tactics with their underground tunnels, learning how to erupt from the ground to ambush enemies or reinforce allies. The Savage Drones have adapted their armour to their new environment, sporting a filtered breathing apparatus and a tinted mask due to the ever-present sandstorms of the Deadlands. They also wear simple cloth wraps that wind around their arms and legs to shield their skin from the sun. And due to the loss of their way of life in combination with their adoption of the MK1 Lancer, many Savage Drones have discarded standard battle tactics and will bayonet charge an enemy without warning. And they were also around 6 foot 7 on average, just like the standard Lokes Drones. We also have the Savage Boomers. Now the Savage Boomer was a Boomer variant that appeared around 17 years after Emergence Day. It is armed with a digger launcher and has different armour compared to the standard Lokes Boomers in the Queen's Guard. They have a larger pointed helmet that only shows their mouth area, a large collar like the grinder, a large breastplate and they have a belt stretching from shoulder to hip with extra digger projectiles. These Boomers have reverted to a tribal mindset and have lost contact with the Queen. They were equipped with the digger launcher but at times were also seen with the boom shot and a butcher cleaver. We also have the Savage Grenadiers and the Savage Grenadier was a locust drone that appeared around 18 months after the sinking of Jacinto. They are drones that reverted to primal ways, they have become tribalistic and are much more aggressive and they use primitive weapons and charge at their enemies like barbarians. So with access to gunpowder becoming far more scarce, Savage Grenadiers opted to use incendiary grenades rather than bolo grenades due to its bountiful resource of flammable alcohol mix and ease in construction. Unlike the normal Grenadiers, the Savage Grenadiers have not limited themselves to the use of one weapon like the Nasher shotgun. They use a range of weapons, including the Hammer Burst, Retro Lancer and Sword Off Shotgun. And the Savage Grenadiers do have the same muscular appearance as the standard Grenadiers, but they wear Savage Locust armour, an aviator's hat and they wear goggles as well. And then there was the Savage Grenadier Elite, who was a Savage Locust variant of the Grenadier Elite and the Grenadier Elite was a higher rank of the standard Grenadier that could take and deal more damage and appeared to be much more seasoned combat operatives. The Savage Grenadier Elite had gone savage after the disappearance of the Locust Queen and the Savage Locust Grenadiers would also not limit themselves to weapons like the Grenadier Elites did they would find any weapons they could use to deadly effect against their foes. Next up we have the Savage Cantus. Now the Savage Cantus were the feral counterpart to the Queen's loyal Cantus monks. Formed after the flooding of the Hollows, the Savage Cantus acted as the shamans to the Savage Locust, 
until their apparent extinction upon the detonation of the emulsion countermeasure weapon. Out of all the locusts, the Cantus priests were hit the hardest after the flooding of the hollows. They reverted to primal shamanistic ways and their healing screams descended into a dark tone. According to records, few sounds can replicate the terror from the screams of a savage Cantus. As I said previously, the savage Cantus didn't act as field commanders like the original Cantus monks did, but they acted as standard infantry, just like the other savage locust, due to the lack of hierarchical military structure. We also had savage Theron guards, who were originally just regular Theron guards, the elite troops, that appeared after the hollow was flooded and the locust horde began falling apart. They are nearly identical to the original Theron guards, except for the colour of their armour, which is nearly bleached white and garnished with red lights. They also used different weapons most of the time. For example, most savage Therons use a butcher cleaver or sword off shotgun rather than their iconic weapon, the talk bow. Now the original Theron guards, they were amongst some of the highest ranking soldiers in the Locust army and they were head and shoulders above the drones in terms of equipment, intelligence and training. They were elite Lokes troops assigned to commando style raids against high profile targets and high level defensive missions that required the sort of precision the Therons possess and can handle. But the savage Therons, just like the Cantus, seemed to act as standard infantry within the savage locust, but of course at the end of the day, the savage Therons were still Therons, so they were still head and shoulders above the drones when it came to their intellect and tactics in battle. We also have the savage marauders. Now it has been theorized that the locust dubbed the savage marauders, of the first kind of locust drones to form any sort of organization outside of the hollow after the events of Operation Hollow Storm. Now this is really important and this signifies how important Savage Marauders were to the Savage Locust because they were essentially the founding fathers of the Savage Locust faction when you think of it. With the success of Operation Hollow Storm for the Coalition of Ordered Governments, the Locust homeland of the Hollows was flooded, forcing any surviving locust to take flight to the surface world. Many of these locusts weren't able to join up with locust queen aligned remnant of the horde, turning savage. So the savage marauders, made of former locust drones, were the first among their number to form any sort of organisation outside the queen's remnant with their patchwork raiding parties. They ultimately became a sort of precursor to the savage locust, but it is unknown if the marauders were eventually phased out with the more common savage locusts. They were brutal, bloodthirsty creatures who most often travelled in war parties in their constant search for supplies. And the savage marauders would wear a conch shell, and this is the same conch shell used to signal other savage locusts of the sighting of enemy forces. We also had the savage hunters. Now the savage hunter is an elite troop, primarily used to track down the hiding gears and humans of Sera. Hunters are bred for one reason, and they do not relent. It doesn't matter that they are abandoned to the Deadlands, you still can't hide from them. Eventually, they will find you, and they are known for their habit of finding humans relentlessly, hence the name Hunter, and they are not to be messed with. And despite the disbandment of the Hunters in favour of Grenadiers earlier on in the Locust War, the Savage Locust, due to either desperation or lack of coherent command structure, led to the return of the Hunter Assassins. They are one of the most vicious and degenerate looking locusts out there. Even amongst the standards of the Savage Locust, they sport large fangs and resemble more like a snake than they do a locust. And they also wear an animal-like mask and scavenged armor as well. The Locust Ragers were actually affiliated with the Savage Locust as well. And the Rager was a specialized locust breed that appeared during the Locust War and were known for their ability to metamorphose into monstrous forms, hence their name Rager. But they were far more dangerous when enraged. When angered, they would go into a state of metamorphosis due to emulsion buildup inside them. But due to their reckless abandon, large amounts of Ragers died off earlier in the Locust War, becoming virtually extinct. They were assumed to become virtually extinct, but a number of Ragers were actually encountered during Baird and his squad's return to Halvor Bay during the Lambent Pandemic. Baird was actually surprised to see them, as they were believed to have been wiped out early in the Locust War. These Ragers were allied with the Savage Locust and became even more feral than when they were at the Horde's command. After the former members of Kilo's squad left Halvor Bay, Ragers had apparently become extinct after the Emulsion Countermeasure weapon was deployed, 
but it's unknown if any rage has mutated to become part of the swarm. Now those are all of the members of the Savage Locust, but they also had many war beasts at their disposal as well. So remember when I stated that the original Locust used many of the hollow creatures to their advantage for military, transportation and so on? Well, the Savage Locust, they used these war beasts as well. So first up we have the Brumac. Now the Brumac was one of the largest species of hollow creature, believed by cog scientists to be the apex predator of the hollow. Cog research indicated that they were bred from apes by the locust, often growing to about 39 feet in height and weighing around 22,000 pounds. They were equipped with wrist mounted chain guns and a back mounted rocket launcher, making them deadly at both close and long range as well, and they possessed incredible strength. These giant reptilian like creatures were enslaved by the locust and used in battle as massive sentient tanks, but several Brumax survived the flooding of the hollow and many were used once again as sentient tanks by the Savage Locust. I also do have a video already on my channel explaining the full lore and backstory behind the Brumax, if you want to check that out as well. The Savage Locust also had wild tickers at their disposal, and tickers were creatures found in the hollow that the Locust used as a mobile landmine by strapping emulsion tanks onto them. They were named after the ticking sound they make while scurrying across the battlefield. Many tickers also survived the flooding of the hollows, so during the Lambent pandemic, Delta infiltrated into the Loke stronghold in the Deadlands and got attacked by several tickers and wild tickers on their voyage. They eventually discovered a ticker assembly line where savage drones and savage grenadiers were applying the emulsion tanks to wild tickers that are chained to a moving rail. They killed some of the tickers in their cages, while they used the tickers in the rail to kill the locusts supplying them with their own explosives. And there was also a cutscene where the savage locust watched two wild tickers fight it to the death, which shows how brutal the savage locust really were. And there were also many wild tickers scurrying around the deadlands in groups, eating away at wreckages and rummaging through anything useful. Now one of the signature creatures that the savage locust used were the locust gas barges. And the locust gas barges were huge creatures that can flow and propel themselves through the air and they first appeared on the surface 18 months after the sinking of Jacinto. After the hollow was flooded, the locust remnant needed a new strategy to fight off the cog and lambent and used the gas barges to do so. Gas barges are able to fly by use of a large floating creature, the top half of which holds gas lighter than air. It is crudely manoeuvred by a navigation system connected to a pair of razor sharp spikes thrusting into the creature's sides, causing the creature to move in whatever direction the locust desired. So these spikes are very similar to horse spurs, only scaled up. However, the craft is quite sluggish and large, meaning that they are very easy to hit, unlike the speedier and smaller reavers. Gas barges carry a platform underneath, these sported four boomshot or MK1 Lancer fitted multi turrets and two dorsal belly turrets on the port and starboard side for attacking cog forces. The Savage Locust also used these to deploy troops into the fight, so the gas barges were great assault airships for them. The Savage Locust also used Siege Beasts. Now, the Siege Beast was a large creature that had been enslaved by the Locust Horde and the Savage Locust as well and turned into a catapult like machine. They were known to be used by the Locust during their pre-industrial era and were reintroduced into their armed forces after the flooding of the Inner Hollow. To operate as a catapult, the creature is forcibly strapped into a war machine with its limb continually bent back so projectiles can be launched at enemy positions. Cole commented on how the Turkey is very accurate at destroying targets, which it was, and the Savage Locust used the Siege Beasts to deadly effect. The Siege Beast is a creature enslaved by the Locust for use as an artillery piece. It has been mounted on a carriage for better mobility and to stop it from turning on its masters, but its head is still exposed and will bite anything close to it. It is armed with a giant catapult on its back made from its own limbs, and it also appears to be a totally self-sufficient weapon, so to prepare it for firing, the large appendages at the front are wound back and held into position. Then a canister on its back opens and deposits a large ball of explosive, organic matter into the cup on the end of the wound limbs. The cupped limbs are then released, creating a huge amount of energy, firing the explosive ordnance accurately, even at long ranges. And it can cause devastating amounts of damage to King Raven helicopters, or even a Brumac when hijacked by Cog Gears. 
No known Saren has seen the Siege Beast before its enslavement to the Horde, but like all hollow creatures, they were effectively tamed and later used as war machines by the Locust Horde. And the Savage Locust also had savage corpses at their disposal as well. So corpses were huge spider-like creatures that lived in the hollow. Like many of the hollow's creatures, corpses were harnessed by the locust as beasts of war. They were often used to dig tunnels so that locust forces could emerge to the surface. Although much of the corpse population was wiped out after Operation Hollow Storm, a sizable number managed to escape and became wild. Some of them were found by the savage locust and kept in captivity to be bred and tamed for battle in the Deadlands. So Delta Squad later confronted a number of these corpses as they made their way through Savage Locust territory. However, Delta Squad accidentally stumbled into a corpse nest. A hatchling burst out of one of the eggs and it was killed when it attempted to attack them. But the death of its offspring enraged the mother corpse, who let out a roar which caused the eggs to hatch. So Delta fought off the Savage Corpse hatchlings and the mother corpse appeared to face its offspring's killers. But Delta Squad managed to kill the mother corpse and the Savage Corpse hatchlings as well. But the Savage Corpse they were another one of the many war beasts used by the Savage Locust in their war effort. It'll be in full power soon. Professor, you said you tested this. How? On myself, Damon. I had to see how the emulsion developed over its life cycle. So I injected myself with it to accelerate things. Oh my God. Dad, we saw what it did to humans and mercy. This tower's too unstable now. I'm sorry, Marcus. I'm not going to make it. It's okay. I'll carry you. Marcus, the emulsion developed faster in me because I forced it to. I had to find out how it reproduced. What are you talking about? Oh, shit. No. You are not going to die. It's too late, Marcus. Every cell in my body's breaking down. And this is going to happen to every contaminated cell on Seraph. It has to. No, goddammit, I can't lose you again. I'm glad I was able to see you again, Marcus. Now go and live for me. God! Hold your fire. Ah, oh, so pious and immoral, even now. Is that what you think? Your father always thought he had all the answers, but he had none. Nothing but clever ways to kill. The Hammer of Dawn. Jacinta. And now, this. And his arrogance finally killed him. Feel that? That's from Dom. And everyone else you killed, you bitch. 